that is going to take you to a specific IP address, right? So that's all a domain uh, DNS uh, record is. So, but there is a slight um, caveat here. There are also, so there's two types of DNS records that we want to talk about. There's CNAME records, which point host names to host names. So a, D uh, a CNAME record would be abccactus.com pointing to abc-cactus.azurewebsites.net. That's a CNAME record, it stands for canonical name. The A record points to an IP address. Same exact deal, except it's specifically pointing to an IP address. Um, so in this example, I've got kind of two kind of example re records. We've got abc.cactus.com pointing to the Azure websites. That's a C name record. And then there's an A record um, in this example where abc.cactus.com is pointing to the IP address 1234, okay? So these are two types of DNS records. If you look at subdomain takeovers and you do research online, you'll probably see that um, most people talk about C name records when it comes to subdomain takeover. I don't see a lot of talk about A records, but it can happen with A records and we'll get more into that later. Anyways, in this scenario, everything's great right now. There's no vulnerability. The website's up, everything looks good. The problem is when we decide to decommission this resource, okay? So we're gonna tear down this resource in the cloud and it's gonna go away, it's not gonna be there anymore. But the DNS record still exists. Okay, that's, that's the ultimate vulnerability. So there is a DNS record that's pointing abc.cactus.com to the host name abccactus.azurewebsites.net and there's nothing there. There's nothing at that location. So if you tried to go to abc.cactus.com, it's not gonna work. You're gonna, get, you're gonna get whatever error message you might get depending on your cloud provider. But a hacker an attacker could create a resource in the cloud at this point, whether it's Azure, AWS, and they can call it abccactus.azurewebsites.net. Now they have taken over your subdomain. So if you ever, if you go up on your browser and you go to abc.cactus.com and you hit enter, you're actually going to end up on a site that's controlled by an attacker, okay? That's the, that's the vulnerability, that's the issue. So, so what are the risks there? So at a minimum, you've got an excellent fishing spot. So grab your tackle box and your fishing pole and camp out at this location. So um, you can create a fake login page. So you'll see the browser actually shows abc.cactus.com. So it looks legit, it looks real. A uh, user might type in their credentials, but it's actually an attacker controlled site and they could be harvesting those credentials or, or whatever. So that's one risk off the bat. The next risk is defacement or reputation issues. Um, so in this example, you know, if you, if you protect your brand very closely, <laughs> uh, you, may, uh, you may not want a website with your, you know, uh, company name and the URL uh, that looks very legitimate to say something that wouldn't look so great um, for your reputation. So and the last one is serving malware. So if you've got a site, maybe your company specifically has software that their customers download, um, a user might trust abc.cactus.com uh, as a link, you know. If they get an email, all of your phishing campaigns to teach people what links not to click, all of it's out the window. This link looks fantastic. Why wouldn't they click it? It says abc.cactus.com. So, so you can kind of bypass some of your uh, phishing campaign knowledge there. Stolen, if users visit this site, it might send the cookies to that site. It's not always true. It really depends on the configuration. And you might also read that cross-site scripting might be more possible. And that's also, true, um, but it really depends on your configuration. So I'm actually gonna jump into these two and we're gonna talk a little bit about what makes that configuration, um, what opens you up to these risks from a subdomain takeover perspective. So as far as stealing cookies go, by default, if any of you are familiar with the same origin policy or SOP, you are by default protected. Your uh, www.cactus.com isn't going to send cookies to abc.cactus.com by default. So the hacker's server isn't gonna get any of your user cookies. Um, but you can override that default behavior and that's by when you set your cookie using the domain attribute um, on your set cookie header, okay? So, um, so in this example, if, if we had a cookie uh, that was set, maybe it was set by www.cactus.com, and it was given an attribute of domain equals cactus.com, the cookie will be sent to abc.cactus.com, okay? Because it's a subdomain of that attribute. So in this example, 
uh, table that I have here, you'll see if it's cactus.com, uh, it will be sent to abc.cactus.com. If it's www.cactus.com, it will not be sent because it's not a subdomain of, of the, of what's abc.cactus.com, it's not a subdomain of www.cactus.com, okay? So the only thing that I could see that would cause you to send cookies to a separate you know, domain, even if it's one that looks like you own it, is this, is this cookie flag. It, it might be possible in certain SSO configurations that use uh, cookies um, and the domain flag that this could, this could present an issue. So uh, in, in the context of SSO, this, is, this might be a problem, so. Okay, and then the next one is cross-site scripting. So I, I have a little example here, uh, a couple of examples of how cross-site scripting might become more possible if a subdomain was taken over. So in this example, we've got a pretty basic website. It's flush with lots of content, as you can see. Um, but one of the things that it does is it imports a script. So let's remember where we are. We're on www.cactus.com. And this, it imports a script from abc.cactus.com. And in this scenario, uh, our hacker took over abc.cactus.com, right? So that subdomain now belongs to the hacker. Whatever is there belongs to the hacker. So the hacker could simply create a script called script.js, and anytime someone loads your site, that script's gonna run. So in this scenario, you've essentially allowed a, an attacker to take over a subdomain um, that one of your other sites imports scripts from. I don't think this is quite as likely because at some point, in order for the hacker to have taken over that subdomain, you had to decommission that resource. So if that script does anything, your site probably broke for a little while while, that, while you were vulnerable to subdomain takeovers, and then, and then you, you didn't notice it, I guess, and then a hacker took it over, and now they could, they could squeeze some XSS by. So that's one way. There's another way I want to talk about, and it's very similar, but it has to do with everyone's favorite security header called the content security policy. Um, so here's a quick example of the content security policy header. So if, if a site like www.cactus.com is uh, using this content security policy, um, you can see that it is allowing scripts to come from abc.cactus.com. So while this header may have been protecting you from XSS before that subdomain was taken over, it is now, there's now a way through this header essentially. There's a hole in your security. And if, uh, and if the attacker took over abc.cactus.com, uh, any scripts that they host could get past this header where, as they couldn't before. Um, so if you are a hacker, if you're a bug bounty researcher, the content security policy might give you a, a decent place to look for juicy subdomains that you could take over. Again, it's likely that their site, your site probably broke at some point before you became vulnerable. So I don't think these scenarios are, these XSS scenarios were quite as likely to occur. You would have had to have JavaScript being imported that wouldn't have been noticed if it wasn't there anymore. The server that was hosting it went away. So, but it can happen. So this is another risk. So that's the XSS risk and the cookies risk. Okay. So enough about the risks. So they're pretty dangerous. Let's talk about getting rid of them. So ultimately, it's a DNS hygiene issue. That's that's where the vulnerability is. It's not in the application code. It's in it's in your DNS records. Um, so you need to find all the DNS that, records that point to cloud resources that you no longer own and remove those DNS records, or in the words of Mr. Smith, find them and destroy them. So here's an uh, example of a DNS records, uh, your DNS records. So in this example, we've got two uh, sites on the bottom that are ABC Cactus. So those are the, the middle entry that points to abccactus.azurewebsites.net. That would be like a C name record. And the one at the bottom would be like an A record. Um, and because our, our hacker has taken those over or because they're vulnerable to subdomains, we need to delete those records, right? Those need to go because they're opening you up to subdomain takeover. Um, the, the challenge is finding those records. So gather all the DNS records that point to a cloud resource. How easy is that to do? Figuring out if the content of your DNS record happens to be something that you have hosted in the cloud or not could be rather challenging. 
Determining if the resource still exists is also maybe not so easy. How do you know for sure that there's nothing there? Um, and then deleting the DNS record. So fortunately, there's a really awesome tool that we actually use called DNS Reaper. You can feed it your DNS um, records using uh, an API token for your DNS provider or by feeding it a list. And it will actually look, it'll find all the records that are pointing to a cloud resource and it'll compare them, compare the response that it gets with, you know, it's an open source community, it's kept up to date, so they've basically fingerprinted like what common cloud provider responses are when there's nothing that's really hosted there. So I've used this uh, for, a, for a few months now in my automation and I haven't had any false positives so far. So it, 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 works, it works fairly well. Um, so caveat with it though, is it only is detecting CNAME records. I spun it up, it was great, it was working, we fixed a bunch of records and then I got a subdomain takeover through the bug bounty program and I was like, um, what? <laughs> I thought I was checking for these. Uh, they were A record uh, submissions. So now I had to solve that problem. So how did I solve that problem? Well, I wrote some automation, and I wanna give you an example of what that automation could look like in case you are interested in implementing that automation. I also have a working script that does exactly this, okay? So the first thing that you'll wanna do is find all the IP records that point to a cloud, uh, a, a cloud IP address, right? So these are A records, so they're IP addresses. Now, I found these two really awesome sites. The first one's actually uh, like more of an API endpoint. The second one gives you back a JSON, but it shows the Azure and AWS IPs, so you can kind of take your, your uh, DNS record IP addresses and check them and see if they are in the cloud. And then you want to find all the public IP addresses in your cloud environment. I provided an Azure example because that's what I'm most familiar with, so you can use the resource graph query with a query like this one, and it will return all of the IP addresses and the subscriptions they came from. There's a little bit of a challenge maybe making sure that your request has enough access to actually get all the IP addresses, but once you overcome that hurdle, you'll have a list of all the IP addresses of your cloud resources. Now you just need to check the two, right? So remove any records that um, are pointing to cloud IPs that are not in your cloud IP list, because they're clearly not yours anymore. Okay, so let's just walk through that really quick. So if we have a DNS record, We've got all these A records on the left and we've got our cloud environment on the right. These are all the IP addresses in our Azure or AWS or GCP environment. We're just gonna iterate through all these IP addresses and check and see if they are in the cloud. We discovered that these two do not point to the cloud and maybe they point to like an on-prem server or something. But uh, these two, uh, the rest of them do point to the cloud and these two exist in our cloud environment. We found them. So that means they're good to go, we don't have to delete them. But what about the one that was left over? So this record is pointing to the cloud, but not to anything we own, okay? So that's how we've detected this dangling DNS record or this vulnerable subdomain takeover. Um, and so that's essentially what my automation is doing. So this is what I run every morning at 8 a.m. I run DNS Reaper with an API token it runs the CNAME scan and saves the results to a JSON file. I then run my custom A record script, which again, you can find on my GitHub, I'll have a link. Um, and it is using Cloudflare and Azure. Um, so it downloads the DNS records from Cloudflare and it uses uh, some Azure credentials to uh, do, the, do the checks I mentioned on the previous slide. We append the results to the JSON file and then I have a Slack message that looks just like this one that hits every morning when my automation runs and lets us know if there are any records we should check out. So whenever, the, uh, whenever I get a hit, nine times out of 10, the previous day, they decommissioned a bunch of stuff and they didn't clean up the DNS records, right? And that is ultimately what the issue is. So I listed some tools here that you might want to, to use. So the first three tools um, are more for your AppSec application security team. Um, the first one is just my script. So this one scans specifically A records and it's written in Python, you can check it out. The second one is the DNS Reaper, it's also written in Python. Um, that's the one I mentioned before. Azure uh, or Microsoft does provide a get dangling DNS records if you're a PowerShell person. Um, and then the last four are actually more for your bug bounty hackers. So if you're on bug bounty and you're like, ooh, 22%, that's tasty, I wanna get in on some of that action. 
um, then you might want to check out these tools. They'll help you find DNS. Uh, they'll help you find some of your DNS records from a from a black box more scenario, right? If you're on an AppSec team, don't use these. Just go get your DNS records straight from your provider. Uh, no need to try to guess what they are. Okay, so that, that's how we detect and automate. Here's a couple other solutions. The first one is what we were using before I automated our checks. Uh, that's a bug bounty program. So you're, you're paying out of pocket for those every time they find one. Uh, you can uh, scope a pen test. Um, you can use a tool like ThreatNG's subdomain takeovers or Prisma from Palo Alto Networks also does subdomain takeovers. So if you're already using these tools, maybe ask about uh, subdomain takeovers. And then there's a company called Detectify that, that does this as well. They actually did a study and uh, between 2020 and 2021, they saw a 25% increase in subdomain takeovers as a vulnerability. And that was three years ago. So with all of our cloud uh, dependencies, that could be going up a little higher. Okay, so let's just talk real quick about preventing it from happening in the first place. I think it's quite obvious. Um, your DNS records are the issue, so improve your decommission process. D DNS records should go down first, and then the resource that it's pointing to. Um, this is usually just skipped, right? We forget to delete DNS records. Um, but there's two things you can also do to reduce the risk, and one of the ones I want to talk about really quick is called a CAA DNS certificate. So this, you would, um, you'd, you'd create this certificate with your DNS provider, and they would not let any other, uh, or uh, sorry, your certificate. Um, so uh, they would not let anyone else create a certificate for your domain, right? Uh, no, no, no other uh, company could do that. So what this protects you from is if somebody took over your, your uh, subdomain, they couldn't use HTTPS on the site because they can't create a certificate for it. Um, because you have a CAA DNS certificate. So this will block people from creating certificates. So it'll make the site look a little less secure. So that might keep your users from actually entering any credentials or trusting the site. Maybe they'll try to go to www.cactus.com and figure out what was going on. And then lastly, that domain cookie. So that, that domain attribute on your cookies is what's going to allow that record to, or the uh, token, the, whatever your um, cookie is, to be sent to any um, servers with, this, with a subdomain. Um, so if you don't do those, then you're, you'll be in good shape. All right, that's all I got. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, that's my script that I run. So I run a script every morning. It, it actually kicks off all by itself. Um, and it is both DNS Reaper followed by my A record scanning, which can be found at this GitHub link. There's a readme to help you figure out how to set it up because you do need some Azure credentials and some Cloudflare credentials. But um, yeah, this is what I'm doing every, every morning at 8 AM uh, is I'm running this script and DNS Reaper. Um, yeah, I can post the slides. I can maybe put a link to them on the Discord or something Perfect. afterwards. Yeah, that works. You can do that. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of different things going on. Yeah. So I think over the last few years, like with automation for detecting uh, and also remediating, right, has gotten a lot more advanced. The, I'm just curious from like your experience, the user education. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the question was basically, how do we how do we prevent these from happening through kind of user education? How do we make sure our uh, IT teams or our developers aren't doing this to themselves? Uh, it's a great question. Um, it really there's really a couple uh, solutions. It, it kind of depends on how your or, uh, organization is is set up. Um, if if there's a chance to if your DNS records are being created by your IT team. Um, then there's probably some, some learning that you would be able to do with your IT team. 
Um, being able to detect it yourself and let them know every time it happens might might get them to kind of say, why why do we keep getting these these tickets from the infosec team? Maybe we should stop doing it. Um, I'll tell you that we we invest in a security champions program, and so a security champion on various development teams and uh, even on IT teams. Um, and then we kind of educate uh, those and do security training with those champions and, and hope that they spread the news. So that's probably what I would recommend. Yeah. Awesome. Any last questions? Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm understanding the question. Can you try one more time? So if you have multiple layers of virtualization in your in your site, yeah. There, you know, there might be the challenge. The challenge is what I've talked about is detecting the vulnerable state. Um, but your question is kind of like, if we've already had the subdomain taken over, how can we detect that? Um, and that that is a lot more challenging because, you know, you can't check is there nothing here, which is what DNS Reaper is kind of doing. It's it's saying is there nothing hosted here. Um, so at that point, you really do have to kind of go the route of looking at all of the publicly kind of exposed um, host names or IP addresses from your cloud environment and just comparing those to what you have in your DNS records, that's, gonna, that's always going to tell you if you have any subdomain takeovers um, or, or if, you, if you're vulnerable or if there are any that are already taken over. Um, just looking at it's all about the DNS records. So cleaning that DNS record system out is going to be what, what helps you. Yeah. And that could be painful, yeah. A validation exercise here would, could be very painful. It's not so easy to, to detect these types of things. It, it, it shocks me that Cloudflare or some of the more uh, cloud providers don't already have some functionality. I suspect that as this becomes a more popular topic, they will develop some of that. But right now, there really isn't anything out of the box that will help you too much with this. Yeah. Awesome. I, hope, I hope that answers your question. You okay. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
when he was speaking, there's a little box on the bottom shelf that kept glitching, so we put it on the bottom shelf. Should we put it on? Shake it. So again, you'll see it because it'll look good. All right, we're going to get started. Thanks for coming to track one. All the cool kids are here. Awesome, so we are here for Come Wi-Fi Me, Wi-Fi and other RF surveillance. Uh, Alyssa is going to present. If you have questions for the Q&A portion, please feel free if you are on the Discord to throw those in that chat and we'll get those at the end. Uh, fun fact about Alyssa, they are sad they missed their dog, so feel free to give them hugs. Just kidding, go team, Alyssa. Yay. Okay, hi, can you hear me okay? It's wobbly up here, go on wobbly. Okay, hi, I'm Alyssa. Um, I know cold opens are more cool than me introducing myself, but I feel like you should get to know me because you'll find out a little bit about me during this talk. So um, let, me, let me say hi. I'm a solutions architect at Bishop Fox. Um, we're an offensive security company, really cool. Um, if you care, Google it. I'm an internet enthusiast. Um, I got a computer when I was three. Does anyone remember those gateways that were like cow print? Yeah, that was my first computer. Um, I dropped out of my PhD. I was at Purdue from my undergrad to PhD. Um, I did a lot while I was there. After 10 years, I got sick of it, so I left. Um, the other things I'm going to mention a little bit later on, um, actually the next is on this slide. So I am super blessed. I get to mentor people through their Security Plus exam um, and helping them find their first job. And uh, two of my students just graduated. <laughs> yeah, clap for them. OK, so I hope they're watching right now. They said they would. Um, and if you are interested, I know everyone's looking for a job right now, but these two are super special. So if you uh, have positions open or are curious, hit me up. This is my email. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you need my email to like add me on LinkedIn. So here it is. Um, they're really cool. Think about it. Okay, so I had some questions while writing this talk um, or what prompted me to write it in the first place. And I hope that we're able to answer all of these today. Uh, we'll see if we you know, uh, are able to do that, but I hope that you guys have a lot of questions too, so feel free to put them in the Discord. I have time at the end of this talk to question and answer and whatnot, so if you don't see your question on the screen, just let me know. Um, okay, so I want to talk about pure freaking magic. Uh, that's Wi-Fi to me. So what is RF? If you came to this talk and didn't know what RF stood for, like, thank you. Like, that's a big jump. Uh, but if you don't know, it stands for radio frequencies. They're a part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, they're before the phase of visible light. I'll show you that on the next slide of, of where we're talking about. Um, there's unintentional radio frequencies that occur in nature, um, and by nature I mean the wild, like not, not like trees, I mean your house. Um, and then intentional, which is why we're all here and we're able to even do this and even talk on the internet um, through the power and magic of Wi-Fi. So um, here are what some radio frequencies look like. It's really important to note that the ones we're talking about are in the non-ionizing spectrum. We're going to get to that. Um, obviously, things like x-rays and um, like sun radiation are, are way down on the, on the spectrum. Um, one thing to note, the lower the frequency, the longer the range, and the higher the frequency, the shorter the range. That's why 2.4 gigahertz has a longer range than 5, right? Um, so what we have here on the, the left is the longer range devices, and then we have all the way up to ionizing radiation, which are like x-rays. Here's what we were talking about. These are the frequency spectrum bands. It's really important to keep a few things in mind, the very low frequency and the um, low frequency. We'll talk about those um, in the books that I'm going to bring up. So there are lots of types of RF. The ones on the left are the most common, the ones that we're going to talk about today, but there are others. You'll notice some of these overlap. 
Um, you'll notice that microwave, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi are on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. This is why if you're microwaving something and you have like a really cheap one and you're wearing Bluetooth headphones, your headphones will like buzz and crack out um, because it's uh, getting interference from the microwave. Um, another thing that they have in common is the uh, high frequency RFID and the NFC are both on that 13.56 megahertz um, wavelength. So um, let's talk about those two actually next. So these are, besides Wi-Fi, uh, so RF that I really like, uh, we have that low, high, and ultra high frequency RFID. We'll get to the purposes of those here in a second. But um, I really like NFC. And uh, this is a globally available unlicensed radio frequency band that you can do whatever with. Um, you guys have tap to pay, right, some of you? Okay. Um, I actually am pro tap to pay. And you're like, what? Yeah, hold on on that. Um, smart tags, access control, inventory list, uh, 3D printed cacti, they're all made with NFC. Um, and NFC stands for near field connection. What is near field? About four centimeters. Um, why do I like these two so much? I am a biohacker. Hi, hello. Um, I'm also terrified of needles. How that happens at the same time, I have no clue for you. Um, but this is the type of tag that I have in my hand. There are more advanced tags now, like the next chip. But this is the one that I have. The ISO 1444-3A is a very common antenna type. It's the kind that you'll see on like Amazon, NFC tags and whatnot. Um, I want to point out something really quick. If you want to get a chip and you're like, oh my gosh, I want to be a biohacker too, I am very biased towards the person on the screen that I have the QR code for. Um, so if you trust my opinion, that's cool. I can't pretend I'm unbiased. This is like my favorite person in the whole world. So a um, little bias there, but if you are looking for an installer, I got one for you. What can't the chip do? So what people think uh, you could do a lot with it and you can't. It's a limited chip. The ID is set. Uh, with certain types of NFC, the IDs rotate for authentication and encryption. We'll get to that. Um, and you can't, because of that, you can't make payments with it. So you can't do that, and it's really important. It's, this comes directly from the Dangerous Things website, this little screenshot here. Chip implants cannot be used for GPS or tracking. It's legit. First off, um, it's near field connection. So with under your skin, with the interference of flesh, it is right on your hand. If my adversary is holding my hand, I have another problem. Um, so it's pretty obvious. I'm not worried about tracking. That's not what these chips can do. So when it comes to can NFC surveil you? No, not really. However, RFID is a little complicated. Not so much in the wild. There's not like RFID readers just everywhere um, in like parks or anything. But when we're talking about shipping, storage facilities, stores, universities, campuses, hospitals. Yes, you can, you can be tracked via RFID. And we'll get into that in the next slide a little bit. There are range limitations of this and most RFID is passive. The kind of RFID in your hand does not have any sort of power, right? Um, or the, the kind that are your um, like fob type, not your car fob, those are active. Actually, I'll just skip to that. Those are active. Um, Car fobs, who, who like unlocks their car with the fob? You all do? Okay. I don't right now only because mine is broken. I'm not gonna pretend to be like, ooh, I'm so secure, mine's just broken. Um, so because it's a lower frequency, the range is about 100 feet. The lower the frequency, the longer the length, right? Um, few readers are required for tracking. There's not many involved. Um, and then the battery does run out. So it has a limited lifespan. Passive RFID is around, around one to five meters. Um, in my experience, it's much less uh, with passive RFID tags. I've not ever been able to read, even with a high power reader, a NFC tag five meters away. However, a meter away, two meters away, very possible. Um, you do require a large number of readers for tracking. Um, so there's that limitation as well. Okay. It's my opinion that you should worry about badge cloning over tracking. It's really hard to track distance and length, like a GPS style, you can't really do that with RFID. So don't worry about that. Who gave you the card, chip, or fob in the first place is more important. Think about it this way. If you have a fob that unlocks your apartment or maybe a door or for your work, do you own that fob? No, you do not. It is property of who gave it to you. Raise your hand if you think the issuer of your RFID fob shouldn't track its location. 
I disagree with you. And we'll get to why uh, when I talk about it. But um, <laughs> I, I, I disagree. Not from a privacy perspective, but for the fact that that's just not how RF, RF works. Um, in a supply chain and inventory setting, we have a lot of different applications for RFID. The one that I found pretty interesting was the pallet tags. I didn't know pallets were individually tagged for location. Thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but there are a lot of different applications and these items can be found uh, moving within buildings. You can find locations, data about them, make sure they're not stolen, all sorts of applications. This question I think is the one that everyone really came for. Um, probably why you're interested. Can Wi-Fi be used to spy on you? Now, um, there are two parts to this talk, and the reason why I wrote the second part is because I didn't want to sound like I'm a fear monger right now. Um, but the answer is, yeah, yeah, I can. Um, Wi-Fi can be used to track your location, your behavior at said locations. Wi-Fi can, quote, see through walls. I have some pictures to explain that. And besides the ability to war drive and find Wi-Fi around you, there's no true detection for someone using Wi-Fi to track you. Um, so it, the detection is not available for most situations. There is specific hardware that can help you. Um, and if you want to find those, uh, take a good Google, make your own. Um, but yeah, your receiver could be what is tracked and think cell phone, iPad, anything with a wireless connection or you. So, oh, and by the way, I am not trying to QR fish you. I, I'm not saying the word that you all are thinking that sounds like moist. Um, I'm not doing that. Um, but if you're interested and you don't trust my QR codes, just Google the title. I'm just trying to be convenient for you. This is a study out of MIT where they were doing um, this kind of what looks like heat map sort of deal with RF through a wall. And the assertions that the researchers came to is that you can tell who is behind the wall, uh, what their handwriting is in the air, um, and um, how a person behind the wall is moving. So the moving part is super interesting. Your gait is a really strong identifier of who you are, how you walk. Um, everyone has a very unique walk. And if you're able to determine how someone is walking, you maybe have like camera images of them walking where you can see it, it is pretty identifiable. Now this one didn't scare me so much. This one did. Um, it's much more accurate to a human shape. Um, I think the researchers in this picture are a little privileged to have their bodies all conform to the same shape and say that it is more, an, 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 I can't say this word, anonymizing, um, whereas people of different heights, gates, sizes, and shapes all would look different on, on this kind of uh, camera-like image. Um, but the researchers actually say that this is a great use for privacy. Um, if we replace RGB cameras with this type of technology, um, there's a lot more privacy for the individuals being on screen. Uh, your face is not being saved, right? So like images of you are not being saved somewhere else for someone else to use. Um, so they actually believe this is a really good privacy application. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. The next part we have to talk about is Wi-Fi positioning systems. Um, this is uh, kind of what you think it sounds like. If you are in some areas that have GDPR compliance, you actually are supposed to be notified that Wi-Fi positioning systems are in use. Um, here, we don't have to. And if you've been to like Walmart, Kroger, Target, Kmart, is Kmart even open still? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, you've already been in a place with Wi-Fi positioning systems. Um, in healthcare applications, it's really good for tracking medical equipment and it's, it can also be used as a real-time location system. One of the ways to track people is with the received signal strength indicator, or SSI. Most manufacturers set their scale from one to 100 with 30 being a great quality signal, sorry, negative 30 decibels. Um, and then um, 90 decibels is basically unusable. Your device will determine what decibel threshold to show you a connection at, but there's actually way more connections around you than what your device is showing you. So this is a couple different ways that we can do that Wi-Fi positioning. The one I just talked about is multilateration. I said the word, Arvin. Wow, I can't say that word, guys. Um, multilateration, very similar to how you think your cell phone is able to multilaterate um, and find your location, very similar. We have angle of arrival and time of flight. The illustration here is for time of flight. Um, it, it, it inserts a space in between broadcasting and then uses that space to measure the distance of receiving that 
information back. So that T response is what we're looking for. And its location accuracy is supposed to be less than 10 meters. I've seen it work to feet. It really depends on the hardware, the interference, the walls, where you are, lots of different mitigating factors. So um, like I said, you've been in locations like this before. It's not a conspiracy. It's a commercial product by Cisco. Um, there are a lot of other people who do it. I'm just picking on Cisco. Um, one thing to know is when you are in this location with uh, like something like Cisco Spaces, they are storing information about your device and holding it. Um, and you're like, okay, Alyssa, I won't connect to the Wi-Fi. No, like your phone is screaming, hey, what Wi-Fi is around me? Can I connect to you? Who are you? All the time. It's looking for your home connections, your saved networks. It is constantly screaming about Wi-Fi all the time. And we can detect that. We can, we can look and store that information. And uh, that's exactly what happened to this guy. Um, so Duncan's is not our hero here, okay? I'm not going to be like, look at this guy for privacy. Let me tell you what this kid did, okay? He went to a dorm room of some students and pretended to be a cop. And uh, then he, he knocked on the door. He's like pretending to be this police officer. And um, he he's takes marijuana and money from the other students. And so the police were able to, you know, like determine, okay, we know it's a male and a couple other factors. And they were trying to find out who was there. So it looked like, according to the access point in the room, there are about 80 to 90 connections around. They were able to filter out the floors, so like people above and below the room, filter all them out, and they found five anomalous devices at night in an all men's dorm. What they found of the five was that two of them were women. Does anyone see a problem with that? Like the privacy implication, like it, it, it's really unsettling to me that they were like, oh yeah, there are two women in all men's dorm at night, we can exclude them. I don't really, if, if that was me, I wouldn't want people to know where I was. Um, turn off your Wi-Fi. So anyway, the ACLU was fighting this under the Fourth Amendment, saying that a person's Wi-Fi connection, or not even the connection, the broadcasting of the ability to connect is a privacy of life and therefore deserving protection. Raise your hand if you believe that. I'm s okay, no, it keep, people are raising it and you're disappointing me. I liked it better when you kept your hand down. No. I just explained how the broadcasting works, right? If you are gonna commit crime, turn off your Wi-Fi, turn off your Bluetooth, <laughs> okay? Just, yeah, that's not legal advice, thank you for saying that, um, but it is Alyssa's personal advice, so. Um, speaking of Bluetooth, we do this one on purpose. Right now, can you find my tile? I have a tile in here. I don't care if you say, oh, Alyssa, I'm gonna find you later. If you're in range of me, again, different threat matrix, okay? Um, most rotate their Mac, uh, MAC addresses automatically. Um, we'll talk about who does. And then that location accuracy is much more <laughs> finite. Um, hidden air tags have been a privacy problem for years. IOS is supposed to tell you if there's an air tag around you following you that is not registered to you. Um, so it's supposed to help mitigate that risk. Uh, but it is what it is. Something that is out of scope that I don't care to talk about is a Stingray. It's a cellular device for surveillance. It's a surveillance device. It surveils you. Okay? Um, what gets more cellular concerns, uh, specifically 5G, I am not ignoring you all or checking my messages. If you've been to one of my talks before, I think you know what's happening. Um, so, um, anyone here fans of Wiggle? I will. T Woo! Okay, Zach, you're on the list. Um, who is? We have lots of Cactus Con here. What's happening, guys? I'm looking at the Wi Fi and Bluetooth of who's around. Um, thank you, Chelsea, for turning off your connections. Thank you for learning from. Last year, um, we have Mike. Is there a Mike in the room that has this shit on? <laughs> okay, no. All right. So, um, I really love Wiggle. It'll help you determine um, a couple of things. We'll get to that next slide. It's really fun. It's war driving. If you're like, oh, I can track people. No, you cannot. That's not how it works. Um, it's really fun. So um, I am a big 3D printing fan. I really like it. Um, in a couple of my past talks, like at GERCON and a couple others, I've given out little trinkets of 3D printing that I have made. 
Um, I dare you strongly, if you disagree with me that NFC can't be used to track you, to take one of my little cacti. Um, I have flat cap little NFC tags and I have cacti up here. Arvin, can you put your hand up real quick? See where he is? Okay, um, I don't want to disturb the speaker after me, so, and I don't care if you try to disturb me during my talk. So if you would like an NFC cactus, um, please take one. One of the cacti and one of the flat ones has a golden ticket on it with an email address and a code to get a prize from me if you read it. So uh, feel free to come up and get them now or later during the talk, just not after the talk. I will leave and go in the hallway. If you want to get one from me there, fine, but I do want to respect the next speaker. So um, pro prove me wrong, okay? So again, this is what Wiggle looked like. Um, we could see here, this was taken on a Southwest flight. So there's no GPS, that's why there's no sync there. But we have Allison and Hunter or D Hunter's laptop. Um, we have some information about the connections and then we see that Samsung Electronics, that's because we have the organizational ID telling us that first part of the MAC address, what type of hardware it is. All right, I am making great time. I'm super proud of myself now. I was worried there for a second. Um, so I, I kind of have been saying, you know, like Wi-Fi can be used to track you, turn your shit off, all sorts of privacy problems. Um, but I want to debunk a couple of things and really kind of address this space a little bit. So let's talk about 5G. I'll wait for the groan. Um, so is 5G harmful to you and your privacy, specifically to you? Now, when I was Googling this issue and I was looking for, again, is it a commercial product or a conspiracy theory? Here, it's both. Um, we have these silly little stickers. Now, there was an engineer at Purdue University who I actually super respected, who kept one of these stickers on her phone. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was selling them or something like that. Um, and apparently these stickers are supposed to reduce the amount of radiation coming from your phone. Um, specifically, the electromagnetic fields causing thermal uh, damage that caused, is caused by radiation. So um, who is Deborah Davis? You can't see the image really well at the bottom here, um, but when I share my slides, you can see them. This product is endorsed by her. Um, so I was like, who is this person? I went down this rabbit hole of like figuring out who this 5G lady was. Um, so she's the founder and president of the Environmental Health Trust. She's one of the leaders of Anti-5G and she has filed many lawsuits against the FCC. Let's dig deeper and discover a little bit more about the Environmental Health Trust. They believe non-ionizing radiation is harmful. Do you remember what I said? Like, oh look over here, we're all in this happy, joyful land. Um, they believe that's actually harmful. Um, believing that the higher the frequency, the higher the harm. And that makes sense, right? Like, the color purple is not gonna hurt you. Super ultraviolet light is, is gonna cause a problem. Uh, they claim it damages RNA. Uh, we'll talk about SAR, but SAR is the specific absorption rate. If its allowance is too high, it can hurt you. They say that the allowance that the FCC gives of SAR ratings for devices um, is too high and not safe. So some things I found when looking up this organization, um, they are a 501c3, so they have to divulge their taxes. But other than that, they have not released any financial statements. What I found interesting was in 2018, we weren't really talking about 5G that much, like it wasn't that big of a concern. And during that year, in 2023, they netted an income of less than $300. However, in 2020, their total revenue was about half a million. And this is definitely because they're receiving money through the fear mongering of 5G. Um, so I looked in a little further, they spend one thing a year. They hold on to all their money and they spend one thing a year and that's on their executive director. Now, am I saying there's financial weirdness going on here? Not really. It's not that much money, half a million dollars. Um, and spending $64,000 a year isn't too much um, on, on that. So I'm not saying there's a big monetary conspiracy. What I'm saying is who is on the leadership board of this organization, right? What do they believe? So I looked her up and she's one of these. 5G is actually a military technology that affects your brain. She's not out here being like, hey, I care about cancer. That's what she says, that's what her story is. No, that's not the real belief. If you go to her blog and read some of her other stuff, it's a little extreme and uh, this is what she actually believes. Now, one thing I actually thought was super cool, and I want one, 
is this easy Wi-Fi on and off timer to reduce the amount of Wi-Fi being broadcast in your home and taking over your brain. Um, here we have this Wi-Fi timer. I want one of these. Why? Because I'm going to set it for work time, eight hours, and then it stops, and then, uh-oh, guys, my internet's off. I can't do anything. <laughs> Oops. I actually really want one of these. Um, I have something disappointing to talk about. So I went to my local library. Shout out to local libraries. Yay! Yay! Um, and I just went and looked for Wi-Fi. I wanted some images, some fun facts for this talk, and I came across these two books. I would like to read some excerpts from them and tell you what they believe instead of me going through it. Um, but I, I'm also going to, and I doubt you can see this, if anyone can read this, like bless. Um, but there are some reviews here from Amazon about these books. So the first one, oh, that's EMF. I'll put it on this one. Um, this is Overpowered, What Science Tells Us About the Dangers of Cell Phones and Other Wi-Fi Age Devices. Uh, this is a conspiracy. So I would like to identify myself as part of the wireless industry. I know I work for an offensive security company, but I'm a Wi-Fi enthusiast, so I'd like to consider myself part of that. Um, and here's what they believe. In other words, the wireless industry has adopted a strategy of manufacturing doubt and the potential negative health effects of their product. Sadly, the strategy has a, lack, uh, has a proven track record. Dow is our product. Since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public, it also means establishing a controversy. So they believe that we're trying to push uh, wireless products just by proving doubt, saying, hey guys, uh, this is all not real. Don't believe these 5G conspiracy people creating doubt to sell product, um, which I find super offensive. The primary reason for the inaction is the meme repeatedly cited about the wireless industry. There's no conclusive proof of harm. I'm not calling it a meme. This is a very important talk, and this is not a joke. This is, uh uh, it's not a meme. This is bullshit. Um, EMF'd. Probably worse, written by Dr. Joseph Mercola. He has a couple of different pieces of information that he says is important. This one really gets me, kind of angers me. The studies linking anxiety and depression to EMF exposure are numerous. For example, in 1994, a study found that workers exposed to broadcast radio frequencies experienced increased anxiety, social anxiety, sleeplessness, and hostility. And in 2011, a study found that high mobile phone uses among adolescents led to increase in stress, sleep disturbances, and depression. Why does that mean it's the Wi-Fi doing it? Correlation does not equal causation. Adolescents are having problems on cell phones because they're using Snapchat and Kik and TikTok, and they're just, the mental health of, of using a cell phone and social media repeatedly is not good for you. I don't have a Facebook. I have Mastodon, and I pretend to use Twitter. Um, it's Twitter. Cancer causes cell phones. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, cancer causes cell phones. Um, so <clears throat> I, I'm kind of pissed off that we're assuming that all these ailments come from radio frequencies. There's a lot more important mitigating factors. Again, correlation does not equal causation, right? Um, and the worst part of it is they say that people can experience electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome, disrupted sleep, Headaches, tinnitus, <laughs> cardiac arrhythmia, skin itching, headaches, confusion, memory loss, panic attacks, dizziness, ear pain, seizures, paralysis, all caused by Wi-Fi, guys. And 5G, and 5G, and 5G. It's never loop. It's never loop. <laughs> um, they have some advice. Remember to turn off your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on your laptop and use a grounded power cord instead of a battery. Connect the internet to a grounded Ethernet plug and then use grounding adapter kits. So I was like, what's a grounding adapter kit? Um, this is where it becomes, again, a product. Um, there's a lot of money to be made here. Um, like the Silver Shield EMF sleeping tent that Joseph put together. Do you know what also Joseph does? He is a prolific author, a doctor. He writes, dark deception, sweet deception, the no-grain diet, effortless healing, Healthy recipes for your nutrition type. Keto fast, super fuel, fat fuel. Dude, you're a dietitian. No qualification to write this in my opinion. All right, so what are they arguing about? Dr. Joseph Mercola and his associates are arguing about thermal effects. 
They also say that non-thermal effects have damage to DNA as well. Um, so that's the one that um, they assert and they have a lot of research for. There is about 30 pages in this book just citing other research. So I can't say they didn't do homework, but I'm saying their homework is invalid. Can we all do something for me real quick? Can you go like this? This. I just caused you all thermal damage. <laughs> Shit. Uh, <laughs> what does the FDA say about that? Um, so when I ask the question, who can you trust? I'm not saying the FDA is perfect, okay? It's not. There's a lot of flaws. But um, more importantly, in studies that we have found, there is no, um, there is a very, very low risk, if any, um, by RF in these studies. Go ahead and take the QR code here. Um, there are no controllable risk factors. In my opinion, we need to be worrying about like microplastics or something um, more than RF. One of the pieces of advice um, when reducing that SAR is to text instead of call. That's why it says someone text the FCC. SAR varies on condition. It's kind of like signal strength and the fact that it varies on condition or the weather or how you feel, um, all sorts of stuff. So uh, cell phones must meet the FCC SAR guidelines. If you look up something via its FCC ID, you can look up a SAR. Um, and uh, that, that minimum value that it has is supposed to keep you safe. The big argument here is that the 16, uh, 1.6 watts per kilogram is too high. Um, in these books, they say a SAR rating of 0 .0, 0 0.0125 is safe, which is obviously a fraction of what the FCC is saying. So is 5G able to track you? Well, the devices are, think about it. It's connected to the internet. You have no reasonable expectation of privacy, in my opinion, to say you can't know my location, but I'm gonna to connect to GPS, I'm gonna to connect to Wi-Fi, I'm gonna to connect to all these things. Why is that? Because again, that's just not how it works. If you're not familiar, wireless access points have location data about them. Um, that's why sometimes you can get location data from Wi-Fi instead of GPS, right? Um, each wireless access point contains information about its location. Um, how do you know that? Um, you can look it up. If you don't want your wireless access point put on a map and stored for this information, you can add underscore no map to your SSID, and a lot of places like Wiggle and Cisco will take it out. Um, but in general, your, your wireless access point does give information about your location. So either you're connecting to Wi-Fi or you're connecting to your cell phone provider and you're connecting via data. Obviously, your cell phone provider has to know where you are to deliver your data. So yeah, the device is trackable. It's like, turn off your phone. Is there anyone here like, that doesn't use a cell phone? Oh, I was hoping to find one guy that was like, yeah, man, I have a flip phone. Um, I was hoping to find that. So anyway, unfortunately, that's just the brass tacks about it. I'm sorry to sound harsh, but that's the truth. Um, but 5G is not cooking your brain. It is not hacking you. It is not tracking you. It is not a government conspiracy. It's the internet. So what can we do about it? I mentioned that MAC addresses are randomized automatically in these operating systems and above. Um, it is done that through locally administrated MAC addresses. Um, you can find this on your phone. If you have, I don't know how you find it on an iPhone. If you have an Android device and you're connecting via Bluetooth, scroll all the way down, there's MAC address and then locally assigned MAC address. That's the randomized one that's being created for your privacy. We could see here on the, the right, I don't know if y'all can see it, it says like Apple, Google, Apple, Apple, a couple different devices. Uh, Wiggle is able to determine the type of device because of the initial part of the MAC address, that organizational ID um, that uh, describes what type of hardware it is. If that hardware device doesn't match the type of device it is, you know you're looking at the randomized MAC address. So let's revisit. Is it a conspiracy theory or is it a commercial product? Has anyone seen one of these before, these chests, these chest fair days? Okay. Um, so this was a study done by Eric Katz. I have mad respect for Eric Katz. Um, so I really suggest that you look up the, his master's thesis, which is what this was. Um, he looked at a study of many different Faraday bags. And let me just skip it all for you. This one let in one text of, I think, 60 or so. The rest of the devices had a failure rate of over half. 
So those Faraday products that you see like this uh, do not work. I want to point out some stuff that irritates me. First off, it's see-through. There are holes in it. If the material somehow magically stopped everything, there are holes in it. Uh, and it's very expensive. Um, this one's less expensive. It's a defense necklace. It's a pendant. It looks like this. It's made of copper. And that means that all the radiation is coming directly here. Forget the rest of your body, every angle possible. No, radiation only happens right here, guys. Um, we have this fabric that you can post anywhere in your house, make clothing out of, all sorts of stuff. It, I think it's itchy. Um, and then we have this. <laughs> It's like a tinfoil hat, but fashionable. <laughs> Ain't it cute, right? Also, for some reason, your face is immune. Like, you gotta protect your brain, but your face, damn. Um, so real talk, let's talk about your threat matrix here. Um, if you have a cell phone, and like I said, you want privacy, please turn it off. Um, I, there, there isn't a way to get reliable data to you without getting some information about your location and some identifying pieces of you, okay? I'm sorry. Um, turn it off. You're fine to get an implant. Uh, again, I know a guy. Um, but you can go to dangerousthings.com, look at the implants yourself, find an installer. Um, it used to happen at DEF CON. I don't think it's going to happen anymore. Um, if you want a story about that, just come find me. But, um, you know, if you're interested, get it done. You're fine. You're not going to get tracked. Um, the NFC tag I gave you is so low risk. That's why I'm giving it out. I doubt that you're going to do anything with it. Um, you've already been in Wi-Fi positioning system spaces before. Um, so, again, when you go into a big box store, a university campus, or something like that, a hospital, and you don't want that information about your device to be kept, turn it off. Uh, also, just a good rule of thumb, do not allow automatic Wi-Fi connections on your devices. This is how rogue access points work, right? So just turn that off. And RF is literally everywhere, um, all the time, right now, through your body, in the room, at this second. So um, unless you go out to like a field, but then you still have like ISPs. So what can you do about it? This advice actually really kind of hurts me. Um, this was on the FCC's website, and uh, they say limit use, text and said, um, increase distance. This is like the same thing that these books are saying. Um, there are general guidelines, like it's not going to hurt you to like talk on speakerphone, I guess. But um, I think it feeds into some of these fears. It's a, it's a jumping off point for people to be like, oh, look what the FCC said. They said keep it away from your body too. Um, no. Okay, so I want to respect the next speaker. Arvin, are there any cacti left? There are a few, and there are flat tags, so I guess we have a couple of minutes if you want to get one now. I don't want the speaker to, the next speaker to get any um, bothersome. But uh, questions? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, I'll get the Discord question first, and then I'll get you and then a couple other people. <laughs> Uh, how do you think about the balance of surveillance and tracking based on protocol design with shifting perceptions of privacy and awareness of technology impacts? Should RF and Wi-Fi protections against tracking be on the end user or should tech designers build tech to be more private instead of requiring people to change behavior for privacy? And there's one. That's a really good question. Um, in my opinion, I would like it to be both. I would like it if tech actually did some privacy enabling features and allowed the things I said to happen that do happen, not. However, the most control that you have is on the end user. So don't wait for the tech people to figure it out. Take control of your privacy now. Yeah, and the other one you kind of answered, but uh, is there any way other than not using your phone to protect yourself against stingrays? To protect yourself against stingrays, um, yeah. So the way that works is if you have any network connection like to your ISP, your, your cell provider, whoever it is, they are able to intercept it. The best thing to do, you can't use those little Faraday bags, okay? The ones that you saw on Amazon, they do not work. Um, turn off your phone is the best solution. If you are going to text, signal. Everyone use signal, right? Yes. So um, if you are going to do that, those will be safe. Um, those messages will not be intercepted. Okay. 
That's it. In the room. Any questions? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so if you guys didn't hear him, he said that it's not just your cell phone. Modern cars have cell, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, TPMS. That's the tire pressure monitoring system. Um, they can all be tracked. And if you're going to commit crime, use your friend's car. And I'm not a lawyer. Not a lawyer. Yes. Can you get what? Yeah, the, wife, the, the installer's information, yeah. You can go to piratespiercings.com. It'll take you to his Instagram page. Where to go? Hold on, hold on. I, I have it somewhere. Oh my god, we're going all the way back. Which town is he in? He's in West Lafayette, Indiana, uh, but he does travel for conferences. So where is it? Here we go. Piratespiercings.com will take you to his Instagram. It's real cool. Yes. So yeah, that's SAR rating. Yeah, so it becomes unsafe when that frequency gets into the ionizing space. That's why I showed it up there. That's the dangerous level where the actual effects can cause thermal damage and other issues. Um, yes. In my opinion, the FCC is probably at the right range. I think they're being generous enough. I don't think they're decreasing it to say like the 1.6 saw. I think that's actually pretty accurate. Um, so maybe they'll lower it in the future or raise it. But for right now, that rating is what I think is accurate. So this one, overpowered, kind of talks about that. Um, but what it has, that information again is a little suspect. Um, it asserts that if you do increase it, even past FCC, that it does become dangerous. Uh, right, don't put your head in the microwave. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I gotta go. Okay, thank you. There's one more question. Oh, okay.
So there you go. All right, here we go. Larry. Um, all right, so, so I'm Larry, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, threat intelligence and um, how, to, how to get up and running very quickly. Um, this talk is, uh, comes, comes out of a series of discussions I had with Andre and when I was earlier in, the, in this year, when I, or last year, sorry, when I was trying to get my head around threat intelligence and what does it mean and, and how does it actually work in the real world. And then I, I, I learned about the platform called MISP and that's kind of what we're going to build it on, 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 build on top of that. And this, this outline here is very loosely goes and uh, lists out what we're going to talk about. So, so what is MISP? It's basically a, it's a, it's it's originally it comes out of Europe. It's a malware sharing a malware information sharing platform. Um, it's completely open source and free. Um, it standardizes threat intelligence. Fully supports all the stuff out there like sticks and, and all, all the way that threat intelligence is created and shared. Um, has robust event and indicator management. So, the event quality events you can create and the IOCs are. are are quite nice. Um, it has a powerful correlation engine, so any field within the event itself and the IOCs in an event can be very easily mapped and correlated to other events, so you can quickly follow trails of events and um, you know APTs and stuff like that. And it's, it's, it has a very uh, nice flexible API, so c completely configurable, customizable. Um, you know, you can program it, you can automate pretty much everything. And so, so what? So what? The core of MISP is actually an event, and it's basically, it's the data um, um, uh, about a security incident, basically, and then all everything related to that security incident is is in that event. Um, it has an I event ID, and using that event ID, it can be correlated with other events, in including all the contents that can, is contained within it. And yeah, there are push rules. So you can actually have rules around when the event gets shared, pushed, received, um, stored. So, so um, that's that's all there. And it's a very robust um, tagging system. So what a tagging the tagging system is is you can label. It's a labeling system, which just labels out there like uh, TLP. I don't know if you're familiar with Traffic Light Protocol, but it's a kind of a sharing uh, sharing label. Um, and how uh, how open is this event? How can it be shared? But there's many others. And these different um, uh, tags have have uh, taxonomies. Um, so there's the tag itself has a st has structure and rules. And then um, there's the thing called Galaxy. Galaxy is basically um, is kind of an organization of metadata that you can attach to events. And and there's many types of metadata families um, at Galaxies that are available. So an a a so an attribute. Um, can uh, in an event can have a data type such as uh, you know just stuff typical of IOCs, um, you know networks, um, uh, hashes for different types of um, uh, malicious programs. So, what's the primary purpose of creating MISP event cor for correlation? The primary purpose of creating updating MISP events is to consume and and link threat intel to to alerts, notables, observables, case, cases, incidents, and stuff like that. So basically, the event itself is there to, so, so you can you can talk about the incident and create data about the incident. Um, and then these events are mapped to threat intel. And it has the ability to run correlations. Um, so you can actually, when you can turn the correlations on and off if you want the correlations. So you'll have the, ma the mappings to other events. And then just, just some data about the, the maximum correlations. We have okay. So what? So what? What can MISP correlate? It can correlate pretty much everything, and then it goes into the type, the types of attributes in the event. There's a, there's a list. There's um, um, you know antivirus, artifacts job, at, at, attribution, external analysis, financial fraud. These are all categories of attributes within the event. And then in, within the event, as I said before, you can have the IOCs, which are file hashes, domain names, IP addresses, URLs, email addresses, and many others. Um, and then this is some just some information about the type of data to avoid, um, and 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 the context for pivot pivoting. Um, 
Yeah, so yeah, don't, don't use stuff like uh, IP destination dash port. Of, and um, and for, for pivoting, basically, um, that's when you have, you have a certain type of data and then you use that data to uh, jump, sort of to build your investigation and to, and to like go find other events and get m more details about events that matter in your investigation. And then um, one thing that's, that's great about MISP is, is that um, it's, it's really amazing at sharing. And so these are, these are just, I'm just, there's a lot of data here, so I'm, just pro I'm providing some links. But the great thing is once you get your MISP instance up and running, um, you can actually map it to other ser MISP servers or organizations, and you can, you can, you can um, syn synchronize their data. You can add servers. You can create a whole net community of MIST servers, and then you can do very have complex sharing systems for, for the uh, for the intelligence. Um, so this is just some links related to that, and then this is this is another sort of um, graphic about like how how you can share data. Um, so you, so there's a, there's MISP instance A, which is one which which has a bunch of um, organizations in it, and then um, if they create events which are those little E's, and they, they want to share the uh, E's with the, uh, with the um, quote on it, and then, they, then you can set up a group within MISP to share only the s s events that have certain tags or, or certain other labels to other organizations that would running, you know, uh, and on another instance somewhere else. So it's just a little, little map of, 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 of how sharing can occur. And then within MISP itself, you can set up sh sharing groups. And this is just a little bit about the UI. So basically, a sharing group is, is basically what events do you want to share with this other, other um, organization on, on, in another server. Once you've loaded a bunch of MISP instances in your MISP server, they'll all, all be available. You'll see the organizations in the remote server. And then you can create a group. And then you can actually specifically tag the events you want to share and they automatically they automatically get synced to the to the other organization or if you're if you're in a sharing group they automatically get synced to you so it's a great way you can create very very granular complex uh, intelligence sharing networks um, uh, no, another great thing is uh, um, is basically uh, for for co when you build these events you want to you want to do some uh, you have a bunch of IOCs, but I want, you want to create an event so you can do some interesting correlation. So you can actually, in the event itself, you can create um, objects of, uh, of that are related IOCs and then um, correlate them. So let's say you have an attack attack tree, you have a process, your child processes that are uh, uh, that are all related. You can actually create e an object for each process, and the IOCs are so associated with that process, and then you can you can uh, link all those together in the same event. And then that's just some information about that. We'll we'll get we'll do some more examples. This is just kind of an overview. Yeah, this is just a, a slide on some correlations. Um, so these are these are all these command. You can actually add all these like command um, lines as as misp attributes in an event, and then you can correlate them with other events that have the same command line um, within the within the misp event. So just a little thing on that. Um, so, okay, so basically this is just uh, uh, some more stuff on, on, on tracking um, uh, with, with MISP objects and uh, we'll get a little more, more, more detail with this. Um, yeah, so just some information on that. Um, so, so, so you've got a bunch of events in MISP and you're sharing them and then um, you want to, you want to bring more data in, and th these are these are just different ways of, different ways of doing it. Um, using feeds, this is an example of a Twitter of a Twitter feed, um, and there's a it's basically how to how to there's a there's a t tweet feed is an actual uh, tw Twitter uh, channel, and you can um, pull it in pull it into MISP uh, all the I IOCs that appear in tweet feed. You, this is just an um, an, an article, uh, online article on, with Python code that shows you how to do that. 
All right, so we're just going to get a little bit into installing this. So, so I wanted to uh, communicate very uh, the quickest way to do it, and the quickest way to get MISP up and running is is basically uh, to uh, use this Docker module, and this is at this GitHub address, and it's quite it's quite easy to do. Uh, so, so basically, once you once you uh, pull, pull it from GitHub, um, you you basically uh, just copy the, uh, the, the, the template that end to end, and then you fill out a few pieces of information like, like, like here, and then uh, that's basically it. And then basically um, that's the Docker Compose, and you just basically, uh, you basically just Docker Compose up and, and you're up and running. One, one thing to make sure about is make sure that you have a base URL um, where you're gonna, where you're gonna host it. Um, and at, at whatever the public IP or whatever IP is or the domain, that's just really, that's the most important thing, um, the base URL. The rest of it actually will, it has some defaults even. And there's actually a default password as well. But here I just, just chose a password. But anyway, so that's basically it. This, th these, are all, these all come from the environment file, so you don't really have to do much even in Docker Compose YAML, but you ca it can be customized and and, and that's it. Um, so basically, uh, these are the defaults. If you don't even touch anything, if you just copy over the environment and then run it, you're, re you're pretty much ready to go. Just to, just add the IP address or domain, that's it. And then you can log in and you're ready to go. Um, one thing you want to do when, once you're up and running is you basically change the d default admin password, um, You know, create some organizations if you want, create a user. Um, sync the galaxies and taxonomies. Um, we'll talk a little about those later, just so you get the latest ones. Um, and then configure the TLP taxonomy. You'll, you'll need this because most most um, events will will be like will have at least a TLP tag. So that's just the share, you know the, the, the traffic light protocol basic sharing tag of of how sensitive the event is. Um, there's other taxonomies you can browse through it. Uh, there's as you can yeah. Anyway. So, so quickly, we're going to go into how to create an event basically from scratch. So, so you're going to cut once you once you create an event, um, you're going to get this little screen, and you're it's basically going to ask you for a few few fields here. Um, how is it going to be shared? The threat level, any type of analysis that occurred, and um, and then you can also link it to other events um, for correlation, like is this, is this related to another event? And you can add a list of events that it's related to. Um, so after you've created some events, you, want, you may want to um, populate the event with, with, with content. And there's just some different ways of, of, of populating the event. You can use a JSON file. There's free text import. Um, there's some templates. Um, there's an open IOC import. Uh, Threat Connect import and some other things, and these are just ways of, of, of quick, if you have a, so so some events can have uh, if there's a lot of attributes in an event they can have thousands of attributes. So uh, so if you're creating a bit, if you can if you if you're analyzing uh, a very complex ca campaign that has a lot of data and the event has a lot of information, you want you, you there's going to be a lot of IOCs, a, a lot of attributes. You you may want to use a bulk import, and these are just some ways of doing that. Um, yeah, so basically free text import, um, you can copy and paste a list of indicators and, and then you can just pull, um, just go right, go into the UI and just pull, pull it right in and it'll add the attributes. Okay, so a little bit about what this looks like in the, in the UI. So I'm just going to go through a scenario of, of adding the event itself. Um, so this is going to be from an online report at that URL. Um, um, it's called, it's the Azeril, um, uh, uh, uh malware campaign. Um, and so, so, so basically this, we're creating this event from scratch. Um, and so this is the basic, um, basic event here. Um, there's the event ID. Um, and, um, yeah. And then we're going to add some attributes to it. So yeah, just like we talked about earlier. Um, is this shared all communities? Threat level is high. Um, analysis initial, um, and then um, then what we can what you do is um, once you have the basic event, um, you know, 
framework uh, created, you have the, the core base event, you want to add information to it. Now, what these, this thing called a galaxy cluster, and what a galaxy cluster is, is, is there, there are different, um, it's metadata that's specific to a type of attribute or incident. Like, so here, um, we're going to add the uh, MITRE ATT&CK um, cluster, um, and MITRE ATT&CK is going to give you a bunch of TTPs you can add to the event. So, so basically, um, we're, we're adding the, the MITRE ATT&CK uh, cluster, um, and then we're basically going to add a bunch of TTPs from that cluster to the event. So these are the actual TTPs within the event that, you're, that you care about, that, that, that will be directly related to this, this particular um, malware campaign. Then you can, add, there's an, another um, uh, Galaxy cluster from, uh, from Malpedia. You could, and then because this particular piece of malware uses Cobalt Strike as a dropper, um, you can add information, uh, oh, not this particular one, but um, yeah. So this actually is the, is the Azeril, um one, so it's actually not Cobalt Strike. But anyway, so we can, we can go into Malpedia and add, add Azeril, um specifically and its derivatives as part of the event. And so that just, you just drop that in. And then, um, you, then from the the research, um, we, there was a whole. Usually, when you see a research article, you'll see at the end a bunch of uh, TTPs and a bunch of IOCs. So you can actually, once you add the TTPs to the uh, event, you can actually add the actual attributes as well. And this is where the a the attributes are added to the event. And um, so, so here we're just adding uh, basically a, a, a hash of one of the payloads within the, ma the malware campaign. Um, we're adding that directly to the, to the event as an attribute. And then um, if you have, if you have uh, a lot of attributes that are, 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 are similar, um, uh, you can add it, add, as, add it as an object. So, um, Here's, here's a template for a link file, um, and then you can, and if this link file um, pulls in a bunch of other um, um, payloads, you can add the attributes of all those payloads, all their hashes, of, and all the scripts that are included in that, that's being called by the link, the link file. Um, you can add that as an object, and you can add the whole object to the MISP event. So once you've got um, everything, uh, added, this is kind of what it looks like in MISP. It's basically a completed event, has an object for the link file, and then it has a whole bunch of other TTPs um, or IOCs uh, related to the network, um, and then some other payload stuff, and this is, all, this is all in there. And then you can actually tag and share all this as well if it needs more further granular detail. So, so that's basically the, man, the manual process um, of adding events. And, and usually when you first start up, um, it's, I, I, I recommend add, you know, to get comfortable adding, adding a bunch of events that matter to you, going out, getting some research reports, um, building events, you know, you know, describing them, loading the, the TTPs and the IOCs from the event into, into your, into your um, a particular event in, in your MISP server. Now, what you can also do, once you, once you build out some events, and then we'll also talk a little bit about lo loading events um, uh, from some um, external sources, um, uh, like the Alien, Alien Vault OTX, which is pretty good. Uh, so anyway, um, so, so in MISP, you can, you, can, you, you can subscribe to feeds. There's a whole bunch of feeds that you can subscribe to to get external intelligence data um, in the UI. Now, this, these feeds are sometimes are like a fire hose of data, and uh, I recommend just loading a feed. At, and it has, so the MIST server has a Redis, a data, live Redis database in it, and so you can actually just cache the data and the IOCs from the feeds, and you can search them. So, so you can actually do, do, pull in a bunch of feeds into the cache, search the, the cache for IOCs that, and events that matter to you, and then only import those, or just search the uh, feeds for um, correlations with the events you've actually created and loaded into your MISP instance. So it's a little bit about that. 
You can also create a scheduled task that periodically will will go out and un, and refresh refresh your feed, your feed caches. Yeah. So this is the screen for the feed, and this is these are just um, there's probably in the in in in, a, in the default there's probably like you know maybe 80 feeds that you can you can kind of look through. Um, and then you just go in and click these and you can cache them into the Redis database or you can download them too if you want. But sometimes uh, you can have, then you have, can have tens of thousands of events in your missed database and it gets to be pretty crazy. And so another thing is you can add a decay model to the event and decay models basically will expire um, the IOCs and the data in the event. And these, there's, there's like a phishing and a network. There's a couple of decay models that are available um, natively. Um, and you can just add those to the events um, that matter to you. And then eventually they will expire. So, so as, as the intelligence um, gets stale, you'll probably, or it's not as important, this decay model will help um, um, kind of prune, prune the events. Uh, and then there's actually a tool in there um, in the MISPR where you can actually create your own custom decay model for the event and the events that matter to you. Um, so this is a little bit about, like when, when I first started with MISP, I basically, um, I, I w was a little weary based on some of my discussions of pulling in a bunch of feeds. So, so basically I just used this script um, and I, with this, you can do it with this command line, um, and then you basically uh, pull, this is a very high quality, it's a very high quality event stream, and if you use this command that's here, it'll pull in all these events um, um, in, into your MISP instance. Um, I would say, uh, usually uh, when you first get started, it'll pull in about five, four or 5,000 um, events that are actually pretty relevant to, to, to real-time, uh, you know, um, campaigns out there, and you'll get to see a little bit about what's going on. It's pretty pretty neat to go through it, and then you can customize it. You can add your own events. Um, really, the most important thing is you. There's this bulk tag. You'll want to bulk tag these events, and also two IDS is an important flag because then you'll be able to pull this into. Um, um, Suricata or some or, or IDSs and other um, um, things like CrowdStrike um, EDRs and you can pull all this stuff in there if they're tagged to IDS because then you can be able to export them. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, so basically, what? How do you get at the events programmatically? There's the MISP API and pretty much anything that you, MISP provides, you can you can program with the MISP API. So you can. Do anything you want with events. You can do anything you want with attributes. You can share and uh, set up sharing and distribution with the API. You can administer users and organizations. You can tag stuff. You can you can uh, you can um, search taxonomies, and um, and you can manage uh, sightings. Like if it, if it, um, if if, if it, it, there's a there's a sighting attribute within the event if the event's been cited and. Um, that's that. That's all program, programmable by the API. Uh, and then, how do you how do you program the API? You use PyMisp, and it's basically a Python library that taught that encapsulates the MISP REST REST, a, REST API. Um, it's great uh, great uh, for searching and exporting data. I use it a lot for that. Um, and that the more the more familiar you get with the MISP search and export. The, the, the more awesome it is because you have complete control over the events and attributes. You can use them, you can share them, um, import them into your, your security tools, um, um, good stuff. Um, yeah, automation script, it's very easy to use as well. And we'll get into some code soon. Um, yeah, you, to, to use, basically to use the API, you really only need uh, the IP address or the domain of your MISP server and, uh, and a key, you create a key inside the MISP uh, console and then you're pretty much ready to go. And this is just the base. This is all you need to get started. Um, you basically um, you 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 in, uh, install Pymis um, when you're using pip and and then you you create you add this to your code and um, and then you create what's called a MISP object, which is down there. And then from that MISP object, you can interact. Whatever, pretty much whatever you want, however you want with the MISP server. And um, 
now, um, if you're going to load events, if you want to, uh, if you let's say, let's say, you know, we talked previously about the UI and how to create them in the UI. Now, if you actually want to, uh, you have a bunch of IOCs. Uh, if you put them in this JSON format, and um, you basically can create, you can create these IOCs from you know anywhere you want, and then put them in this JSON format, and then you can load them. Um, and this is very simple. Here's some code to load, load it. Um, yeah, you basically connect to the MISP server, you open the file, and then you add the event to the, uh, to the server, and that's it. Then they just appear. You actually actually have to add it to an event. Sorry, you can, you can create the event with the API as well, but you can add it to a particular event. You just put it in the at, yeah. Uh, here's some other tools um, that, that integrate nicely with MISP. Um, there's phishing. Um, uh, phishing information um, script, a uh, suricata, uh, so you can search for indicators that you can use in your suricata. Um, uh, the polarity domain analysis platform is it can be integrated, and if you use sigma rules, you can um, you can import your sigma rules as well. <clears throat> this is some detail about. Um, about mis misp search. So this is really what, what's really important. And the more you familiar you get with the misp search, search capability in, in PyMISP, the more you can search the data. And these are just some of the things you can use within the search, um, the, the misp search um, function within, within PyMISP. And this is just some of the things you can do. Um, you can like look for threat levels. You can look for different types of analysis, attributes. Um, yeah, so very granular stuff about the event, whether the event can, is, has the two IDS flags, you can e export it to a security tool, you know, different, yeah, hashes, oops, yeah. And then this is how you actually, that, that's kind of like the different things you can search on, and this is actually how you can build a search with, uh, with filters. So basically, you all those things that, that you can build very complex searches, and here's an example of that. Um, so, so this is just searches um, the miss for event ID with at that date with those tags and threat levels and stuff. So yeah, you can search the events that way. Um, and it's a little bit more about the search function. Very fairly robust. Um, so these are all things you can use to search the events with. Um, and so, uh, so another thing is, which I like to, to, to use is uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, so basically, you can get you could, all the stuff we talked about. You could do straight from a Jupyter Notebook directly connected to your your MISP instance, and this is very simple. You can you can install it with Jupyter Notebooks with those two two lines of of code. You can actually there's a Jupyter extension in Visual Studio. Um, code, which is actually quite nice, because you can also, it also integrates with Markdown, and you can add, uh, you can do, like, you can document your research with a Markdown um, in the Jupyter, in the uh, Visual Studio Jupyter Notebook, very nice. Uh, you can create a config.py, and in that config.py, you just put in your uh, MISP URL and your MISP key, and then then you can use that straight in the, in the notebook code. And then, so as part of this talk, we've, uh, um, sometime today I'm, I'm, I'm opening up a, a GitHub and there's all the stuff we talked about. There's tons of code um, already there. There's a, there's a notebook with tons of, of searches and, and, and conversions between MISP and sticks and all kinds of stuff in that Jupyter Notebook that, that I'm releasing. Um, and this is it. This is how you use Ju uh, MISP with Jupyter. You basically add this, add this to a, a, a cell, um, create your MISP object, and you're pretty much ready to go. Then you can use the MISP object in other cells, and you can build your searches um, and, and do your analysis. And there's another, here's some more, here's a sample Jupyter um, cell. Um, basically, I'm just searching for that, for that. Um, so basically, here's this was just basically that what I talked about the OTX feed. So all that data that came down from the OTX feed, I just said I wanted to see see that and have it printed out um, in a very easy to read way, if, especially if there's a lot of events. So this is just a little piece of code that does that. It just searches the MISP instance for, for that particular tag and prints out some some data about the event for you. 
so so also you can in, uh, you can integrate it miss very very easily with with other uh, sims so here's a here's a little example of uh, integrating your misp instance with elastic elastic agent which is um, um, I'm not sure how many people have used Elastic Agent, but the Elastic Agent has a very nice integration with MISP. It's all, you pretty much, it's all pretty much ready, ready to go. Uh, it automatically indexes everything in your, with your events in, in, uh, in the Elk stack. Now, as part of, of the GitHub, um, I actually wrote a Flask web service that, that lets you customize searches using the MISP API that will um, uh, do custom searches for you um, um, against a MISP instance, and so that will be in the, in the source code. And then you can, you can run, run that as a web service. You can use curl against it. Um, and then um, I also have a sample log stash HTTP polar in the, in the code, which is going to um, just basically, you'll be able to configure it um, um, to, to search stuff in the, uh, the web service, and then it, you in, insert it into an, uh, an um, uh, Elasticsearch index. So it's, that's all ready to go. So if you want to play around with that, that will be available. And, uh, and then Sentinel, this is something I've been working on um, for, my, for my own personal work, is um, integrating MISP with Sentinel. Um, so Sentinel has a, has a, has a TI module and then with that TI module you can get the indicators and then you can you build KQL searches from those indicators which is really nice. Um, so basically integrates, um, used to have integrate via the Microsoft Graph um, and but Microsoft recently deprecated the graph for indicators and now now is um, using what's called the, uh, the upload indicators API which is completely sticks based. Now I've had some problems because it seems like in a typical Microsoft fashion, it's not 100% sticks compatible, even though they say it is. So you got sometimes you have to tweak it a little bit. But uh, there's a script out there which is fairly nice, which is written by one of the MISP core contributors. Um, it's MISP to Sentinel. This will take MISP events from your MISP instance and and, and put them right into um, Sentinel. Uh, and um, basically, tr it'll it, it'll um, trans it'll basically change the MISP event into a sticks event, and then insert it into the indicators API. And then you'll see it in you'll see it in the uh, Sentinel TI um, um, uh, database. And it also has Azure function support, which is kind of nice. So you can set up an Azure function and call MISP to Sentinel to 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 um, import the, uh, the MISP, MISP events and in, 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 in IOCs. And so I have had some trouble with, with because of stuff like the R rules. Uh, it doesn't, this script doesn't seem to like the R rules. And the author is like, well, the R rules aren't really supported well by Sentinel. But so I've got a script that's, that I'm going to include that actually does the MISP to sticks translation for you and shows you what the sticks object looks like. Um, um, in the Jupyter Notebook so that you can actually see what you're inserting into Sentinel. So that's part, a part of the Jupyter no Notebook release. And so what, so MISP, MISP sticks, yeah, so that's basically, um, well, MISP provides this library so that if your TI platform or tool requires sticks, it, it'll convert the MISP object to sticks, basically. And yeah, so that map, this this uh, this uh, I sometimes take it with a grain of salt. Maps and misp objects in galaxies um, s with semantically sim similar objects and sticks. That can be a little sticky, and that's why I have I, I usually like to play around with the conversion um, before I insert into sen Sentinel. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what it looks like when you get it when you get into uh, an, into your Sentinel threat intelligence, and then you can grab using the, in KQL, you can grab any one of these IOCs and, and you know, then you can build some um, detections and then you can push them out to defend, defender, defender, if you're using defender in your environment. And uh, it's, it's a nice way to add custom intelligence to, so, so if, you, if you build an event in MISP, um, and uh, about a particular ma a ransomware malware that you worry about in your organization, um, you can um, 
import it um, into um, Sentinel, build a detection for it, and then push it out to all your um, your um, defender in, uh, uh, endpoints, which is, which I do quite a bit. Um, yeah, so that so that basically that so now um, we'll just get into the last few few details here about distributing IOCs. So you can you so so as we talked about in the MISP event, there's a bunch of IOCs in there, right? Um, and so uh, sometimes you really you need to export them um, and to use them like like we talked about. We can you can sync them to SIM. You can sync them to Sentinel. But sometimes you just need the the raw list of, of the IOCs and to import them in a, another tool. So, so that's what that's why uh, the Python code is really nice. The MISP API you can just out, uh, export all the uh, IOCs with the two IDs set to one, and then you just create 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 that file with those JSON objects, or you can turn it, or you can create a CSV, whatever whatever the tool, or just a list of name value list in text, and to import them into your uh, what a tool of choice um, and so yeah so so basically um, yeah this is if you if anybody out there uses CrowdStrike so CrowdStrike has got uh, an IOC API uh, Python API that you can use to um, upload IOCs with and this actually works really nicely with MISP as well um, you can just um, you know use your PyMIS script export all the indicators that you care about um, uh, with the two IDS flag, and then in the same Python script, you can just use this this particular API to uh, import it into your CrowdStrike endpoints. And I think that's pretty much it. So yeah, <clears throat> so to conclude, um, MISP is a great way to learn and operationalize threat intelligence. Like I had no no idea about threat intelligence, and then until I started playing with it. Now, now I'm like kind of up, you know, creating my own events, doing my own research, uh, you know, learning about different attacks, integrating them with tools. Um, it's really as as you as you saw, it's really just a couple of Docker containers to get to get up up and running. Um, it's easy to get started, but at the same time, it's a very mature and deep platform. It's actually used by NATO to share threat intelligence. So, in, uh, it's 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 there's quite a bit out there. Um, it's a very helpful community. Um, so, I'm gonna check in a bunch of code, and it'll be available sometime today. And if anybody has any questions, you can just email me, or or talk to Andre on Discord. That's basically it. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. And, and then as soon as I, I have a couple things to check in, uh, it's sometime later tonight. You can just uh, all the code will be available on GitHub. Yeah. Tons of examples. Uh, way more than I even what covered in the talk. Anybody else? Nobody's gonna stand between us and lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry and um, Andre on Discord. So thanks, guys. Good job. You uh, impressed everybody. We got a cord.
there, so when it's time to talk, I can just pull it out. Well, they can sit like right down there, right? Or you can just hand them off the microphone. And then just like as you introduce them, I would just hit slide. Yeah, I mean the cues are in the document. Okay. I'll be fine. <clears throat> okay. And that's just a kill screen. Just remember, it's just like a filler. Okay. The transition between the two things. Oh yeah, that's gonna look cool up there. How does uh? Oh, but it's off. Let me ask her if I can adjust that.
Natalie, what screen do you want me to leave it on while you're figuring this out? What screen do you want it on while you're figuring this out? Oh, that one's fine. Okay. If the whole stage collapses because my ass is too big. Sorry. Well, he's testing it real quick. Yeah. Okay. Hello, stage it. Hello. Oh, the very, very so, first one? Uh, ah, go back. Come back. Oh, no. Something with some borders on the slide here.
was thinking maybe if there, what if we add them down at the front? Like the both of them. Um, and it won't be like as good to see the speakers, but maybe if we put all of the chairs down at the front. Because then at least everybody would be on equal standing. Yeah, or see if they have handheld mics that they have. I feel like they would at least have handhelds for the audience. I don't know how we would use these mics so that the people. It's not that you're worried about someone stealing or whatever, but if it's encrypted, you have four more changes. Oh, you said there's nine, not ten, right? So you'd have to add three chairs somewhere somehow. Like, I guess that's the only thing that would change. Like, everything you have to do is good here, and like PHS and FBI and different. I mean, even if you got. Even if you move the tables though, these are like right next to each other. That little part right here is probably from Storm of the Brain. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit out of whack a little bit, but. Are we good on the other one? Yeah, actually, you've got order over here. Four seasons, bro. Let's see if we can fix that. Now that you got that one perfect. So, is it. Nine plus NG or eight plus NG? And they stood up to talk, they leaned up to talk. Because no one's talking um, without being called upon. I mean, we could theoretically just do four chairs in the back like this and then. Yeah, but look, this is right. Oh, and that's barely even giving you room. So. And then, like, NG is kind of. Mm -hmm. So and so. Yeah. I mean, honestly, even if we just had a high boy table, a high boy table on either side, but then the mic could be. Well, I don't know. Mm. Well, first, where would we get that mic? Well, I, well it's, I only think it works because we're at a convention center and they definitely have some. But oh, yeah, I did yeah, say right. you told somebody they needed more. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Like right chairs up there. Right, you guys are sick. All right, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. This is charging it, right? Yeah, it's a fun little It's not. Uh, do you have your cord with you? Oh, this is charging it. So this is charging. This is. Just remember that.
good. Screens look good. Okay. Only thing we're trying to figure out logistically is how you're going to get two more chairs up here. There's no way. But there's no way. We can get chairs here. And the only thing I, yeah, I mean. Right. I mean, if we put the chairs down there, you're just going to be up here. As the queen. <laughs> just going to be what? You're gonna just be up here as like the queen of everybody. And then they'll be down here at the bottom. Um, the only thing is, I don't, these are all wired into the table. So I don't know how easy it'll be to pass them. I know. <laughs> no, I know, but the. Well, I don't see the problem. Well, because. We don't know how long the cord goes, so like if someone's like sat right here. No, my question is like, will they reach? Basically. Yeah, I'm not certain if they. Have you guys actually moved this at all? Testing, testing. I just I'm just worried about like the cords being in between. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Cords with arms, with arms. Yeah, but it just proves that it works. Yeah, I mean if it's never in the back. So then does one of us up here just like hanging them down? Someone's gonna be sitting right there. Okay, they'd have to hand it down so and they'll hand it to the person on the wall. We might be overthinking this because they may just have some extra hand yeah. That's what I said. To, I don't think they do. It's just that, that clear. Yeah. 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 as far as we can, and we thought about moving them back, but just as soon as Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did. I didn't say Surely two more people would be fine, especially if they lean on the wall for some of the... Where, where, where are you at? If I go through the floor, I'm yeah. taking time off work. <laughs> yeah. It's a perfect time to do it. Okay. I'll walk the other thing is like the chairs are rocking chairs, so you run the risk of them accidentally getting caught. For sure. So I mean, there is a, uh, a handheld. We can have a couple people basically just stand in front of the podium uh, when they're Yeah. Yeah. And then even if they don't have to sit right above you, pull that up and hand it down to them. Yeah, that's great. I'll uh, hand me the closest mic. Yeah, this is where I can go, so you just... <laughs> or you could get the tall people. Put the tall people down in front.
I'm just, I'm going to be the running around person, I guess. Keep in mind this email set up a whole other part, so. Yeah, I just don't want to talk into a microphone. Yeah, yeah, I just can, uh, I mean, at some point, you know, we'll alert it up here because we are not going to be special. Okay. You don't need me to do anything else? Okay. I was only up here because you told me to sit here. <laughs> I don't like being in front. Yes, but we're like digital part of the panel. Okay. Grab these. You can kind of do this, or we can bring up one.
Awesome. And then I'm going to move it. I can move it too, so it's not. This is so fun. from the screen.
Yeah. Um, did you have any uh, videos that you're playing with the audio inside of it? No. Okay. I was told that it's a surefire way to have it not work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were having um, some issues. And then um, it's not on that mic, it's just this mic. Yeah, it's just this podium mic, and then if you need to, you can pop on that. Awesome. Ones as well. Okay. I think we have the um, are you normally a pretty uh, loud speaker when presenting? Or just wondering what I should tell us, uh, our guy, in case he needs to raise the. Maybe average to loud? Okay. Yeah. So I'll just have it right there. And I'll let you fidget with it too if you need to. Um, let me. Uh... Jess! I'll uh, unmute it real quick if you want to just say a few words just to test and make sure that you're comfortable with how sure. that sounds. Yep. Testing, testing. Okay. So if I'm back here. Okay, so I gotta lean in or pull this forward. Okay. Better? Good? No? Closer? All right, great.
Keynote, come on in, grab a seat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We here at INGSOC appreciate your conformance to our agenda here today. A uh, couple of announcements because uh, what is an overarching bureaucracy without announcements? Merch is open, so make sure you uh, check out the merch table. We have stickers, posters, badges. Our t-shirts were lost by UPS, so that's fun. But you can buy other stuff. Uh, when you get your badge, the awesome, cool, flashy badges that you see, uh, go to badge.cactuscom.com. That teaches you how to put your badge together and get it online so that we may continue to track your conformance and rate your abilities. And also so you can maybe turn in some of your fellow denizens for potential thought crimes. It's up to you. Uh, also, uh, so tomorrow at the closing ceremonies, we are raffling off two OWASP San Francisco 2024 tickets. Very cool. When you come into closing ceremonies, you'll get a ticket. We'll do a raffle. Must be present to win. All right, let's get this show on the road. So I am really excited to announce Rihanna Pfefferkorn. Rihanna is a research scholar at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Her work investigates government policies and practices around encryption, specifically decryption and influencing crypto-related design of platforms. Rihanna's brilliant on both the technical and the legal aspects of these issues and how they intertwine and become really complicated together. Rihanna also researches the benefits and detriments of strong encryption on free expression, political engagement, economic development, and other public interests. Uh, Rihanna and I met several years ago at DEF CON Crypto and Privacy Village, where I bought $50 worth of bananas that had to be paid for individually, and Rihanna wore a suit that looked like your grandmother's upholstered couch. It was pretty great. So I'll turn it over. Let's welcome Rihanna Pfefferkorn. Thank you guys so much for having me here. Um, my name is Rihanna. I work at the Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, I historically have done a lot of work around encryption policy. As you just heard, um, today is going to be a little bit different, maybe not that different. The last cybersecurity conference I spoke at was Usenix Enigma last January, where I did a stand-up comedy routine, after which Usenix canceled the Enigma conference forever. So uh, apparently nobody told CactusCon, so here I am. Lucky you. All right. So before coming to Stanford, I was an associate at a big law firm in the Bay Area, which is to say I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. Nothing that I say during this talk is legal advice, nor is anything that I say in any hallway conversations you and I might have. As a colleague of mine who is a law professor at Stanford says in his email signature, if this were legal advice, it would be followed by a bill. All right. So that disclaimer is important because what I want to talk about today is the legal risks that face good faith cybersecurity researchers, which maybe that includes some of you folks here today. Um, the field of cybersecurity always needs more people on the defense side looking for bugs, trying to make things better rather than taking advantage of flaws. But doing research in this area, even when your intent is to make things better, carries legal risk that is important for practitioners, students, for everybody to know about. And there are a number of laws on the books just in the United States, and maybe we're going to get into the rest of the world, that have been applied against security researchers in the past. So here are some of the main laws. So gallery of rogues uh, that have been used uh, to pose legal risk to security research. Most of these, with the exception of the last one, can be enforced either criminally or civilly, meaning either the government can fine you or potentially throw you in jail, or somebody who's been harmed by your conduct can sue you to get you to knock it off or maybe pay them some money. This overview is drawn from a terrific guide that I've uh, linked to at the, at the bottom there that a couple of, uh, of uh, scholars at Harvard at their cyber law clinic put out in 2020. Um, since it is from 2020, it's a little bit outdated now. Some important court decisions have come out since then. Nevertheless, it's still a really useful guide. The Electronic Frontier Foundation helped with that document, and they have guidance online at the EFF website uh, for security researchers as well. So, Probably the big one in this space, the 800 pound gorilla is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or the CFAA, uh, which is the federal anti-hacking statute. It was passed in the 1980s in order to prohibit the use of hacking techniques to gain unauthorized access to electronic data. At a high level, the CFAA prohibits two things, um, two types of conduct, accessing a computer without authorization or exceeding the 
access that you are authorized to have. And it covers any internet connected device in some circumstances, uh, as our election security expert folks can tell you, even air gapped devices now. Uh, so as a researcher, accessing devices that you don't own without the owner's permission might risk violating the CFAA, even if you don't do any damage to the device, even if you don't exfiltrate a bunch of sensitive information from the system. Um, in addition to criminal penalties, the CFAA allows anybody who suffered more than $5,000 worth of loss, as defined by the statute, uh, to sue the person who allegedly made them uh, incur that loss. And the statutory definition is broad enough uh, that it can, can even include things like remediation uh, for vulnerabilities that were disclosed to you. So, um, in addition to that being a fairly broad definition, $5,000 is a really thro low threshold that hasn't been updated in a number of decades. You can easily blow past $5,000 almost instantaneously with any kind of instant response at this point. A dollar now is not the same as it was in the 80s or in the 90s. So in, on top of that, on top of being both criminally enforceable or civilly enforceable, this is just the federal law. Most states have their own anti-hacking laws as well, uh, some of which are pretty similar to uh, the CFAA, and some of which don't even have that same $5,000 damage threshold to be able to walk in the door of the courthouse. So in addition to the CFAA, another source of legal risk to researchers is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, ECPA for short. This covers eavesdropping. Um, and as the name suggests, this is supposed to protect privacy in your electronic communications, so uh, it prohibits the unauthorized interception of the contents of phone calls, emails, um, text messages, also things like Wi-Fi payload data. So if you're doing research that includes sniffing Wi-Fi, you might potentially run afoul of the ECBA. You might remember Google Street View got in a lot of trouble for this um, about a dozen years ago or so uh, because they were effectively more driving around and collecting payload data uh, while trying to, to create Google Street Maps. And so similar to the CFA, although the ECPA is federal, there are state equivalents. In fact, state wiretapping laws go back 100 years longer than the federal wiretapping law. There was a wiretapping law in the 1860s that was originally intended to apply to telegraph and telegram cables. Um, another one you've probably heard of, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or the DMCA. Um, this is meant to protect uh, copyrighted works from access and copy that is not authorized and is a way of trying to exert control over the stuff that you buy with your hard-earned money, um, computers, software, smartphone, ebooks, gaming consoles, and the DMCA is a law that says it's mostly illegal to bypass digital rights management technologies uh, that are put on those things in order to regain control over the stuff that you bought. So if your security research involves circumventing measures that were supposed to prevent or restrict access to software to other copyrighted works, which can include circumventing things like encryption, password requirements, uh, handshakes, the DMCA can potentially pose a legal risk to that work. And while the statute contains a narrow exception on the books for uh, security uh, testing uh, as a defense that can be raised against a, a DMCA claim, as far as I can tell in my research, no defendant has ever successfully raised the security testing defense by the time they've actually gotten sued under the DMCA. Um, so it doesn't seem like that's worth very much. And then you get into intellectual property law. We've just been talking about the DMCA, the C stands for copyright. Um, if you are accessing, uh, copying, modifying, or running software that you didn't write and that you don't have the permission of the copyright holder, which is usually going to be the, the software author to copy or modify or run that, that might be a risk of being accused of copyright infringement. This happened to uh, Corellium when they were making virtualization software for iOS testing uh, a few years ago. They were accused of both copyright infringement and DMCA violations. Um, and then maybe a little less so, Revealing trade secret information potentially might come up maybe a little less uh, of a risk than being accused of copyright infringement. Um, and then probably the big one, and one that uh, doesn't just depend on, on federal law, would be uh, contract law. Because end user license agreement, terms of service, non-disclosure agreement, those are just contracts. And so if you breach that contract by violating a term, uh, such as something against scraping, or against reverse engineering, or doing other kinds of, of testing, crawling, um, that might be a breach of contract, and you might potentially face lit risk uh, from a um, aggrieved vendor uh, for breaching that contract. Same goes for if you violate the terms of an NDA, for example. Obviously, the risk of 
the prospect of getting sued for breaching a contract is less scary than the potential to go to prison for CFA violations, but still not fun. Like as a lawyer at a big law firm, I don't even want to tell you how much, how much money I got charged out for on the hour, on an hourly basis for that. Like it's hard to get uh, affordable legal research. So these laws pose a little bit of a damn if you do and damn if you don't situation. Because if you're ignorant of the fact that these laws exist, you might violate them because you don't know any better. And you might get in trouble, or at least you might get threatened with legal action, which is also usually not any fun and not very cheap and pretty stressful. So we want people to know what the law is beforehand so that they don't find out the hard way. On the other hand, if you are aware of these, that these laws exist, you might be too scared of liability to do the research that you want to do, to look for bugs, uh, to report those bugs responsibly, even though it might be better for everybody if all those bugs were found and got patched. And normally, being scared off from doing something that might potentially be illegal because you don't want to be punished for is a sign that the law is working as intended. One of the purposes of having laws, especially criminal law, is deterrence. So that if people know that they might get punished for doing something, they're not going to do it, is the thinking. Well, it's all well and good if the conduct that's being deterred is murder or bank robbery, something like that. But when laws that are passed uh, to keep people from antisocial conduct uh, end up deterring and chilling pro-social conduct like vulnerability research, well, that's a sign that the law is failing as a matter of sound public policy. And yet that has long been the case with security research in the United States. And the threat of liability under various federal and sometimes state laws has had a chilling re effect on cybersecurity research for decades at this point. I mean, the people who want to do research or even who just want to disclose the things that they found, maybe stumbled across without even meaning to find a vulnerability, um, have been scared off because they might be afraid of running afoul of the law and getting sued or getting charged with a crime. And yet, at the same time as these laws have had a chilling effect on the people who are trying to do better and trying to help and make things better, they haven't had a deterrent effect on the malicious actors, the Chinese and Russian state affiliated actors, the North Korean state affiliated actors, the members of ransomware groups that are widely distributed often in a lot of other countries. A lot of those folks are pretty sure that they're never going to see the inside of a courtroom in the United States. So we have a situation where the helpers are being scared off and that makes us less able to defend against the bad guys who are not being scared off by those same laws. So, with all that said, this is one area where like policy has actually been like going in a good direction. Like I was, I was saying before beforehand to Jamie that like as somebody who does a lot of tech policy work, I'm not used to being like things are getting better. Normally it's just like oh man, but no, things have actually been getting a lot better over time. And so over the course of years, there's been recognition of the fact that there's been this total backfiring in terms of uh, the law not deterring the black hats uh, while deterring the white hats when we need more white hats more than ever in order to, to fend off the Hats. And so we have both the government and the vendors of various software, hardware, firmware, they figured out that they need all hands on deck to help them out. Um, so we've stopped hitting ourselves in the face quite as much as we used to. But it's still not 100% safe to go back in the water. Um, but things are a lot better than they were when I first started going to cybersecurity conferences uh, over 20 years ago. So my first DEF CON was in 2002 when I was still in college. And I do not know why the kids these days keep idealizing the 2000s. New metal sucked. <laughs> Having low-rise jeans with the whale tail? With the whale tail? That sucked! George W. Bush sucked! The 2000s sucked! Quit idealizing those things, you kids! Get off my lawn! And especially in the 2000s, there was a distinct trend of liability uh, under the law for giving a talk at Black Hat or at DEF CON. People got sued. People were gagged for even giving their talks in the first place. People got arrested. This stuff happens so often that there's an entire notable incidents category of the Wikipedia page for DEF CON. So let's take a little trip down history to down memory lane. Um, 2001 at DEF CON, a Russian software engineer named Dmitry Sklarov was arrested the day after giving a talk about the shoddy security on Adobe's eBooks. He uh, worked for a Russian company called Elcomsoft. They produced software that circumvented the copy protection DRM on Adobe's eBook file format, something that was not a crime in Russia, where the DMCA is not the law. And after his arrest, he eventually got released on bail, but it took five months for him to be let go and allowed to return to his home country after DEF CON. And the only reason that the government let him go and agreed to drop the charges against him was because instead they were going to go after his employer and criminally charge the company that he worked for. Um, that trial took place 
in San Jose in late 2002, and all of the charges uh, uh, guilt, uh, were deemed not guilty by the jury. Kind of a waste of everybody's time. Um, 2005 at Black Hat Cisco Gate, where uh, Mike Lynn, a security researcher, gave a talk where his demo showed that he could use uh, remote code execution to gain control over a Cisco router, which everybody thought could not be done. Turns out you can. His Prezo didn't give away exploit code, didn't even give enough information for anybody who was listening to it to create exploit code, and by the time he gave the talk, Cisco had already fixed the problem and they'd stopped distributing the vulnerable code by that time. Initially, his employer, uh, an outfit called Internet Security Systems, had okayed the talk. They changed their minds and forbade him from giving it. His response, screw you guys, I'm going to Vegas, I'm quitting my job. He gave the talk anyway. And like right before the conference started, Cisco sent people like to the conference center to get ISS, his former employer, said he breached his NDA with them by giving this talk. And they also claimed that they owned the copyright in his talk, not, <laughs> not him. So that's some chutzpah. Um, so he got a lawyer, actually somebody who I used to work for, and a terrific lawyer named Jennifer Granick, if anybody knows her. And the case got settled after about 24 hours of like non-stop activity by the lawyers on all sides. Um, but that didn't stop FBI agents from showing up after the civil case had been settled and asking questions. Nobody really figured exactly what that was about because Jennifer at least figured out there was an arrest warrant or anything out for them. They're not usually very forthcoming about what they're doing though, so they didn't just say like, here's what we're doing here at Black Hat, sniffing around. Anyway, so Cisco Gate, still a name that will live in infamy. Um, and then in 2008, several MIT students wanted to demonstrate a vulnerability that they'd found in the transit card system for the Boston metropolitan area. Um, they ended up being represented by the Electronic Frontier Foundation after uh, the transit agency went to court and got a gag order from a judge preventing them from presenting their talk, discussing their findings at all. Major First Amendment problem, as the FF lawyers pointed out, and as a lot of other commentators pointed out at the time, eventually that gag order expired, but not until after the conference was over. So while these students from MIT were eventually allowed to discuss what they'd found, and to publish their findings, they still, you know, time is of the essence, they missed the opportunity to give that talk if they were planning to do at DEF CON. And this is a really scary theory of saying that even just discussing vulnerabilities in a product is illegal. Not just are you distributing code, are you making a tool for you know, circumventing or for eavesdropping or whatever, even just talking about it on stage. It's a really, really scary and pretty broad uh, stance to take. So this is what we were facing in, in the aughts, in the bad old days. So how many of you were alive in 2008? Most, most of you, okay. How about 2005? Yeah, okay, how about 2001? Good, okay. Kids these days do not know how good they have it. By comparison to the 2000s, overall things have gotten a lot better. So the hacker community has grown up mostly. Then there's been less of what we used to see, um, especially at DEF CON, especially in the 2000s, where a lot of the incentive to show off a cool hack you did was that you could do sort of a name and shame, and part of that was for social clout, for prestige among your peers. There's a little less of that now. The community has overall embraced responsible vulnerability disclosure. We have a lot of good best practices now in place. Vendors also, to give them some credit, have also showed up, mostly, and they've adopted phone disclosure programs. They've adopted bug bounties. Um, I went on Hacker One to see what they got right now. They have about 435 bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs listed right now. Um, and then more recently, there was what could have been a repeat of the Boston uh, Transit Card Agency DEF CON snafu, where last year there was another talk at DEF CON in 2023, again by local Boston area students, again about vulnerabilities in the Boston Transit Card System, but this time the transit agency did not sue them. They worked collaboratively with the students. Um, they said, can you come and demonstrate to us at our headquarters, show us what you found, um, deliver a presentation. And then they said, hey, could you maybe obscure part of your technique when you're talking about this publicly so that it would be harder for mad faith hackers to replicate that? And the student said, okay. Um, so it actually went well. There wasn't a lawsuit. Yay. But part of the reason that it went that well was that this time there was a, there's a, a I mentioned the Harvard Cyber Law Clinic, they can provide advice to people who are doing security research to help them along the way to make sure that uh, nobody gets their pennies in a knot and goes to court over something like this. It just so happens that, as far as I know, the only two legal clinics that provide uh, assistance to security researchers happen to be for MIT 
and at Harvard. MIT is, is in collaboration with Boston University School of Law, since MIT doesn't have a law school, which is probably better for everybody, because God forbid if you had a bunch of nerds who also have law degrees. But <laughs> at BU and Harvard, right there in Boston, these happen to be some high school students, actually, in Boston who are giving, uh, who want to give this talk. Um, and so, conveniently, they have these resources in, in their backyard. Um, so things have been getting better with vendors, and then the government also has recognized that they really want hackers on their side instead of threatening to throw them in jail. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, which is the consumer protection watchdog for the United States, has for about the last 10 years um, taken the position that, um, you know, Poor cybersecurity is uh, an unfair, deceptive trade actor practice. And one thing that can be an unfair business practice is failing to respond to vulnerability reports, whether those are coming in from the public, from academics, uh, from various other third parties. And so when the FTC has issued uh, enforcement actions against various companies, including HTC America um, and Asus Tech, uh, they have said one of the things that they have cited as being unreasonable security practices by those companies was that they were ignoring vulnerability reports. And the FTC has even pointed out, look, there are, there are free tools out there for monitoring vulnerabilities that get reported in. There's really just no excuse for this at this point. So that's great to say that the, even the Consumer Protection Agency says we need for companies to be doing a better job of responding to vulnerabilities. Um, since 2016, the Department of Defense has had the hack the pe Pentagon, can't talk, um, to invite people to come and, and hack on various uh, defense department systems. And in fact, since 2020, federal agencies, at least on the civilian side, have been required to have vulnerability disclosure programs. That's terrific. Um, one of the few good things, in my opinion, to come out of the Trump administration was the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Look how fast I was able to say that. CISA. Um, and they have been a terrific partner for um, both promulgating some sample of VDPs for uh, various other agencies to have, for being an incoming uh, report, a, a place that will t take reports in if you don't have a point of contact at a particular company, for example. And then also, Another good sign, in 2022, the Department of Justice, which is the federal prosecutors, they enforce federal criminal law, uh, said that they were no longer going to, uh, they have a policy of no longer prosecuting good faith security research. So all of these things are really good, like positive developments. Um, but even now, good deeds don't always go unpunished. So there are a few examples that I've put up here of continuing legal threats to researchers. Up here in the top left corner, uh, I have a personal connection to this. This is a story of legal threats that were made against my students by their own fellow students. Um, there's an app called Fizz that I understand is popular on college campuses. That came out of uh, some students at Stanford who wrote that while they were still an undergrad before they dropped out to go work on Fizz full time. Um, some of my former students and RAs and TAs um, who run the Applied Cybersecurity Club at Stanford uh, decided to work and say like, hey, let's see if there's any, uh, any vulnerabilities in Fizz. It's a Firebase mobile app. app. Guess what? They're wrong because it's Firebase. So they found some stuff and they described Close that to the students who had written Fizz. And what things did they get? They got a threat letter from a lawyer threatening to sue them, threatening to refer them for criminal charges, and even accusing them of criminal conspiracy, like a drug gang, because they were chatting together about looking for vulnerabilities in this app. Um, this pissed me off enough that I wrote a whole law journal article about the CFAA and how they go after security researchers for reporting vulnerabilities responsibly. Um, Eventually, they backed off because luckily for them, they knew me, they knew my co-instructor for the cybersecurity course that I co-teach at Stanford. They came to us, they said, do you know anybody? We said, here's our links to folks that we know at the EFF. The EFF represented them, and the lawyers backed down. Um, and then the Stanford Daily published about it. So, stars and effect, folks. It's not a great look. Um, similarly, when a journalist found that a state agency website in Missouri was disclosing uh, personal, in, personal identifiable information about a bunch of state uh, employees, uh, that journalist responsibly went and disclosed that, and the governor threatened to have him thrown in prison for violating Missouri's anti-hacking law. Missouri is the show me state. Apparently, show me includes using inspect elements, the elite hack source strategy for finding a bunch of PII for state employees. And so even though this is not exactly elite hack source shit, the Missouri governor wanted to throw one of their own journalists uh, in prison. Not out of keeping, honestly, for that particular governor, not the biggest friend to journalists. 
nevertheless, um, it took a year before the county pro level prosecutors uh, where this journalist resided in Missouri said we're, we're not going to press charges against this person. And then even more recently, this story is just from last November, um, there are various vendors that provide software for managing court records uh, to various state and local uh, courts around the country. Um, somebody who isn't even a professional researcher, the, uh, a programmer, like somebody who works in software but not a cybersecurity researcher by trade, found vulnerabilities in uh, court record systems that were used in uh, at least five different states that would allow court records that are supposed to be under seal to be viewed by anybody with some fair low-tech uh, strategies. Um, given the sensitivity of the information that is in sealed court records, um, that's not a good thing, having had to, to seal records myself when I was, uh, when I was a, a practicing lawyer. And of course, what thanks did this, uh, did this person get for disclosing this responsibly? Threats by county level uh, officials in one Florida county that uses this court record system threatening to bring legal action uh, under Florida's anti-hacking laws. So we are not all the way there yet when it comes to protecting researchers. Um, so we have these laws, and in particular the CFA and its state equivalents and the DMCA, and they've had a chilling effect on good faith research. I've been giving examples that span 22 years, going back to 2001, the Dimitri Sklarov case, that was a DMCA case, um, those MIT students in 2008 who got gagged from presenting their findings, that was a CFAA case. And in fact, the very first criminal prosecution under the CFAA was against a researcher who was a grad student at the time, uh, Robert Morris Jr., so named the, for the eponymous Morris Worm, which wreaked havoc on a big portion of computers that were connected to the internet at the time, did hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage, took a big chunk of the nascent internet offline for several days. And you know, this wasn't because he was trying to wreak havoc, he was trying to measure the size of the internet. Perfectly valid thing that people do in computer science across departments across the country, uh, even to this day and age. Not necessarily the best design worm, and I might not have done all of that, so you know, things worked out for him. He's a professor at MIT, and he co-founded Y Combinator, so you know, crime does pay. Uh, he does not list that on his bio among his like works and presentations. I don't know why, but anyway, you know, he's a grad student who's trying to do security research, maybe not as well as he could have. He did a bunch of damage, but it just goes to show that when you have the DMCA being used against Dmitry Skorov a couple of years after it had passed into law, when you have the Morris Worms maker being criminally prosecuted and convicted only a couple of years after the CFAA had come into effect, you start out across the entire lifetime of these laws having to be enforced against people who are doing security research, these high profile prosecutions. It's understandable why there's such a cloud of fear that these laws cast even over people who are trying to do good faith work in a responsible way. So we have come a long way though. So vulnerability disclosure programs, bug bounties, they do allow researchers to try to contract around the most damaging effects of these laws that would otherwise come into play. Um, this is a workaround. If we have bad laws in the books, how can we try and find some workaround for it? Well, we can try and contract around it with VDPs and with bug bounties to say you're free to look for bugs in my product and as long as you stay in bounds within these rules and you don't color outside the lines, then I won't, I won't sue you. But it's not so great insofar as bug bounties and VDPs don't necessarily have all of the ironclad protections that they get held out as. Now, what happens in snow talks stays in snow talks, but there was a great uh, presentation about this earlier this morning about the drawbacks and frustrations with vulnerability disclosure practices these days. And so there have been some publications doing analysis of the terms in bug bounties and VDPs, and they found that those policies are often poorly drafted, they're really long, they're hard to understand, they're full of legalese. Maybe there's even conflicting terms between the bug bounty and the terms of use or the EULA that is in place. So which one governs? How are you supposed to know what you're supposed to do? And they can impose very onerous requirements on researchers that make it kind of hard to actually jump through all of those hoops and, and, and dot your I's and cross the T's correctly. And the safe harbors aren't necessarily as ironclad as you might want them to be as somebody who's offered this as a take it or leave it uh, to, to try and accept or not in order to do the work you want to do. Um, they don't often contain strong contractual uh, protections from liability for researchers and they tend to allocate legal risk onto the, the participant. So there's a lot of discretion left to the vendor to decide whether or not 
they want to wiggle out of, of what they agree to do. And even if they do violate their contractual agreement, the consequences will often be harsher for the researcher than for the vendor. If you're familiar with a mobile voting app called Votes, which uh, somebody will hear from later, Yale Grower wrote a terrific article disclosing their bad behavior a few years ago. They managed to be the first company ever kicked off of the, the hacker one bug bounty platform because they retroactively changed their bug bounty terms to make it look like a, a college student at the University of Michigan taking an election security class had violated those bug bounty terms by doing research on, on their app. And in fact, that student had followed the terms that were in place at the time. So they tried to retcon it to make it look like it was bad. Shocked that student to the FBI and to state authorities in West Virginia. So this is what I mean. They broke their own contractual agreement. And yet it was the student who was being shot to the FBI. Not great. Apparently nothing ever happened to that student. I don't think so. But it goes to show that VDPs and bug bounties aren't necessarily always all that they're cracked up to be. Still, to the extent that those are trying to contract around the worst effects of underlying laws like the CFA and the DMCA, it has gotten harder uh, to prosecute or sue researchers for their work um, in recent years. The DMCA is a weird statute in that in addition to statutory carve-outs for liability for things like security testing, it also has um, this weird process where every three years you can go to the Copyright Office to petition for an exemption from the DMCA so that for conduct that would otherwise be illegal, every three years you can get a temporary rulemaking saying, yeah, it's okay for you to do that. And so since 2015, there has been an exception granted for good faith security research uh, that was renewed and expanded in 2018, again in 2021, to cover more types of research activities, uh, to remove some onerous restrictions from an early version of the, uh, the exemption that required uh, testing, security testing in a lab type environment, which isn't great if you're testing like an HVAC system, something you can't just drag into a lab, for example. And that's what enabled the DEF CON voting village to happen, is having this temporary exemption from the DMCA. If you buy a voting machine off eBay so you can hack on it, well, you're on that computer, so you can't make unauthorized access to it under the CFAA, that's fine. But to the extent that there's copyrighted software on those voting machines and you're trying to, to get around controls on that, the DMCA is still in play. And so having this exemption is what has allowed uh, the, the legal uh, you know, peace of mind necessary to have the voting village at DEF CON. And then similarly, the CFAA, things have gotten better there too. Uh, in a case called Van Buren versus the United States, the very first uh, CFAA case decided by the Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court in a, a rare show of uh, wanting things to be better for Americans rather than worse, um, said we're going to narrow the scope of how uh, the CFA has been applied. There has been a split among the lower courts as to whether violating terms of service or an acceptable use policy for a computer, for a database, whether that is also a violation of the CFAA. And the Supreme Court said that it is not. That's great news for security researchers. It's great news for anybody whose research might include violating terms of service because that's not just security research. It's even things like uh, social science research. If you want to create sock puppet accounts to look for job hiring discrimination on a job website or uh, housing discrimination on a housing website, for example. Those are also real world examples of, of people who were worried that their research might violate the CFA. So that's great news. Um, and one of the uh, things that have come out of that, as I mentioned, is that the Department of Justice uh, said, using the DMCA's d definition of good faith security research, they said we're going to have a policy against charging the CFAA in situations where somebody was doing good faith security research. That's only after this, the, the DOJ had gotten up in the Van Buren case to say, yeah, we do think that terms of service violations should also be a CFA violation. It took them a year to like get over their snit and come out with this policy saying we're not going to go after researchers if they're doing good faith research. But still, it's better. It's better. The DOJ has been trying to repair their relationship with this community for a long time. This is them actually kind of putting that in writing. I think a lot of people have been kind of skeptical of it. Um, uh, nevertheless, if, to the extent they've changed the tune, that's still a great development. Uh, but these aren't perfect. So for one thing, the good faith security research exemption under the DMCA is not permanent. Like I mentioned, it's every three years. So not only do you have to keep reapplying like plates spinning in the air every three years, somebody has to file a petition with the Copyright Office saying, please renew it. But if you want to change any of the language of the exemption, you have to file a separate petition. So you can't just say, can you change this and to an or, you know, or whatever. You have to file another petition and be like, can you expand it to cover this or to stop covering this, etc. cetera. So it's not a, an efficient way of, of making law. And the fact that this exemption has continued to be perpetuated 
time after time through this triennial rulemaking process shows that maybe that just shouldn't have been illegal conduct in the DNC to begin with, and yet we don't have uh, statutory carve-outs that would encompass good faith security research from DMCA were stuck with this inefficient means of uh, trying to keep those plates spinning every three years. On the CFA side, the DOJ CFA policy is not a law. It's even less protection than the DMCA carve out in, in, in that regard. And that's not an actual amendment to the CFAA. Individual prosecutors could ignore that policy. The policy could change or be withdrawn at any time. But even if the DOJ keeps this policy forever, it still only applies to federal criminal prosecutions. It doesn't apply to civil plaintiffs. It doesn't apply to state level hacking charges. So the examples that I just showed um, of the Missouri and the Florida officials threatening uh, people who made disclosures under state anti-hacking law, this wouldn't do anything for that because the DOJ only enforces federal criminal laws. And for the most part, the main source of legal risk from the CFAA for years now hasn't been on the criminal side. There are certainly criminal prosecutions that happen of like actual malicious hackers every year do get indicted, but most of the CFAA cases every year are civil. And it has gotten to the point where the civil right of action under the, DMCA, or under the CFAA has been abused for a long time to go after business competitors, to go after departing employees, in addition to threatening good faith security researchers. So to the extent that the DOJ's policy against charging criminal uh, claims under the CFAA only covers the criminal side, there's still the biggest need for mitigating the legal risk under the CFAA is to do something more to reduce the risk of lawsuits on the civil side. So that's still an urgent topic. So we've come a long way, but there is still a lot to do. One thing is that we do need more clarity on what does or does not constitute good faith conduct. Um, the way that it's defined is as an activity that's carried out in a manner designed to avoid any harm to individuals or the public and where the information derived from the activity is used primarily to promote security or safety. When this policy came out, uh, Brian Krebs wrote at Krebs on security that there's a big gray area that a lot of research doesn't necessarily fall into in between something that is really clearly uh, good faith security research within this definition versus something that is obvious like off the chain malicious behavior and clearly not in good faith. And Brian Krebs wrote that often the source of a researcher's unease is that they recognize they might have taken their discovery just a tad too far. Maybe you take a little more information than you could have if you find a database that's spewing people's personal information instead of saying, look, I can find my own, you take a thousand people's records. Okay, is that good faith or not? Who knows, right? And so there's concern that you might want to disclose what you found, but you might not be sure if what you did constitutes good faith security research within the bounds after you uh, under the CFAA. So we still need more clarity on how this would apply to those completely not at all uncommon real life scenarios in order to further minimize the chilling effect on researchers who might want to help and who want to disclose the vulnerabilities they find, but they're not sure am I acting in good faith or not. We also need, I think, an affirmative right to good faith security research to rule them all, rather than having these temporary piecemeal carve-outs uh, under one or the other law, uh, just for the CFA or just for the DMCA, and without effect on uh, state level laws. It would be great to have something at that level. I don't know that Congress is going to get on that anytime soon. So in the meantime, we need more electronic frontier foundations because not everybody goes to MIT or goes to Harvard or has access to and, and knows that lawyers exist. Um, you know, you know, it would be great for society if we had more networks of lawyers out there who are well versed in the CFA and the DMCA and all these laws who could provide uh, legal advice on an affordable basis for regular middle class folks who don't always work uh, within companies that have to cover them legally for the work that they do. Um, there is something new that just started last year called the Security Research Legal Defense Fund. Um, this is created by uh, Harley Geiger and uh, Jim Dempsey who works with me at Stanford, a couple other folks, um, they just made their, th their deal is that they won't find a lawyer for you, they won't hire a lawyer for you, but if you find your own lawyer, they will make a grant uh, for you if you want to try and, and mitigate any potential legal risk to, to your, uh, your work that you do. They just made their first grant to some Polish train hackers that you might have read about in the news. I think legal uh, advice is probably cheaper in Poland than it is here, but nevertheless, it's a great uh, first, first uh, effort for them to be backing. 
Um, so we do need more people who are out there like the EFF uh, so that the EFF doesn't have to spend their entire DEF CON on the lookout and they can just like get drunk and go dancing like everybody else does. Um, and in the meantime, as long as we have these laws on the books, I do think that we should be making it harder to sue researchers. Um, in the article that I wrote after I got mad at the Stanford students threatening to sue my Stanford students, um, I recommended that the CFA should at least have some statutory language change that would make it harder to uh, allege the $5,000 in loss so that merely patching a bug against some future hacker rather than saying I'm patching this against you would not allow you to say you cost me $5,000 in vulnerability remediation and not count that towards uh, the ability to go to court. I also think that it would be helpful to have a fee shifting provision written into the, the CFAA. Under American law, um, normally each side carries their own costs in court. So in other countries, if you sue somebody and you lose, you have to pay their costs. In America, if you sue somebody and you lose, um, each side usually bears their own costs. There are uh, a number of laws though, especially things like civil rights laws, other laws intend to promote the public interest that do what's called fee shifting where if you are the prevailing party, you can make the other side pay your costs. So if there were a fee shifting provision under the CFA or under some of these other laws uh, that are used against researchers, uh, not only if you failed to prevail by suing somebody for what turned out to be good faith security research, not only could they then get their attorney's fees back from you, but there would also be a great weapon in the first place if you sent a threat letter, if somebody could respond to that threat letter and say, hey, by the way, if you even try to take me to court over this, I'm going to get my cost back from you. I think that would keep a lot of these sorts of threats uh, from, from being made, hopefully, in the first place, if the, the vendors who are trying to bully researchers into silence knew that they could end up um, paying uh, the bills uh, for defending against those sorts of bad faith lawsuits. Um, and then, like, this is a learning for, I would, like, it would be great if we all had terrible job security and people didn't write such crappy code to begin with. Um, there's a big push, including at the federal government level lately, for security by design principles. Um, there's also a renewed push for increased accountability after the fact when vendors uh, have vulnerabilities that are harmfully exploited. We could have an entire conference on the topic of whether there should be legal liability for poorly written software. That's a perennial topic that comes up again and again. And like, you know, other things, like, you know, if this blows up or if the tires on my car blow up, there's products liability for those things. If that happens, there isn't products liability for software, by and large. And now we are seeing, once again, there is a big push uh, at, at the federal level. Uh, the Office of the National Cyber Director says they're going to release several ideas or a paper on what cyber, or on what uh, security uh, flaws should uh, be punishable by. So it's a big topic. It's beyond the scope of this. Nevertheless, just having FTC enforcement here and there. Um, I think a lot of the, the frustration that you see in this community around vulnerability disclosure is why is it that they can sweep things under the rug and, even, and sue me into staying quiet, or at least threaten me into staying quiet, and they don't have to be held accountable for writing crappy software in the first place. Well, one of the reasons that that even continues to happen is that for people who go into security by going to college for computer science, which definitely is not everybody, but even those who do, security is not a required course for CS majors at any of the top uh, universities for computer science in the United States. Um, the top two dozen, none of them require uh, security. People, there's research showing that people only think about coding securely if they're told that you should be writing your, your code securely. And you know, people are still doing stupid memory safety bugs in the year of our Lord 2024. Like, come on. So there's a lot to be done to, to make things better, even though we have really come a long way uh, on this. Um, and there's ways that you can get involved. So I mentioned the uh, Security Research Legal Defense Fund, if you're somebody who's already uh, doing this kind of work and you would like some uh, potential uh, assistance there, you could potentially apply for a grant from them. Uh, the Good Faith Cybersecurity Research Coalition is a, ooh, now I screwed that up, uh, is a group that is, I think, mostly European focused. Weirdly, like the Belgians are better about this than we are, but um, given the huge uh, you know, software industry in Belgium, um, you would think. Nevertheless, those places get involved. Disclosed.io has been a little quieter since the, the good old days when we were uh, responding to stupid arguments by votes and stupid uh, Supreme Court arguments by votes. We won in the, in the Van Buren case, and so this has been a little bit quieter lately, but nevertheless, uh, you can join their Slack. Um, and then on the civic participation side, um, you can always call 
state representatives in DC to voice your opinions on greater liability for shoddy software design or on passing a law to amend the, the CFAA or to repeal the DMCA, et cetera. You can make a petition to, under the DMCA every three years. It's 2024, so that's going on right now, so you'd have to wait another three years. It'll still be there for you when we get around to that point in time. And here in Arizona, there's something called the Request to Speak system that you can use to provide feedback on state level bills uh, to contact your, your elected representatives uh, here locally. And then because federal agencies, executive branch agencies, have really been at the forefront on cybersecurity regulation in recent years across various domains, not just the FTC, but the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the TSA, all sorts of agencies are getting involved with writing cybersecurity regulations. And as a member of the public, you can just provide feedback on notices of proposed rulemaking by federal agencies. And then if you want to move to DC, where it's just as hot as it is here, but it's humid, which makes it worse. Um, <laughs> We can apply to join Tech Congress, which uh, provides pretty decently paid fellowships to go and be a member of congressional staff, either on a committee or the specific member of Congress uh, for people who are earlier mid-career technologists. And I know several people, including former students, who've gone to do that. They can often go on to have permanent jobs, even after their fellowship is over, continuing to work in Congress to help them write better and minimally stupid uh, regulations when it comes to things that impact security. All right, so I think we have a little bit of time for questions. I want to reiterate, I do not give legal advice. Let uh, me come over for questions now. All right, we got time. The Discord, the Discord has questions. So. Uh, it is, by the way, I'm a new fan forever. You're amazing. How do the vulnerabilities marketplaces and those researchers fit into the US regulatory framework? And what about the global laws? Are VDPs helping reduce the incentives and sell to shady firms and places? That's a great question. I mean, I think like to the, ex to the extent that the question is about are VDPs helping reduce incentives to sell, like. I think it kind of depends what it is. Like, as long as the average bug bounty payout is still somewhere around 2,800 bucks, like that can be, you know, it's, that's not nothing. But like, as opposed to like, I think Zerodium offers what is it like a million dollars for like an iOS exploit. Like, it's hard to say depending on the severity of it. Like, you know, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. Um, I don't know a lot about the, the the global context. I will admit about how this is is going. I think there's probably a lot more work to do in other countries because they're going to have their own laws on the books that may or may not track ours in terms of providing protections for research. Perfect. Other, other Discord that questions? Was that was it? Okay. Question. All right. All right. Yes. Does it, does it seem like, like CISA is advocating for more protections against uh, vulnerabilities and exposure inside the, like the policy? Um, is, like so what is CISA doing? It's a great question. I mean, so I think they've been, like, they don't have like punitive enforcement powers, right? So I don't think there's much that they can do to like punish agencies that don't enforce their VDPs or that break their VDPs. And I think they're mostly in sort of a lead by example mode where the idea being if federal agencies do it or if we have federal rules that impact federal procurement contracts, for example, that's a way of having trickle down policy for the private sector as well. Um, as far as I know, like CISA seems to have their heart in the right place. I don't know whether they either do or think it is in their lane to do advocacy on amending the laws that are on the books, but it's a great question. I've been a big fan of CISA overall. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was for the definition of good faith security research. This is a really, really difficult topic because the big fear is what if we write a definition of good faith security research that lets us penalize too few people? Like, what if we let people do more crimes? Because there's this fear that malicious actors will pretend to be good faith actors in order to uh, get past it. My personal view is that like the definition that's on the books is at, uh, on the books, but that's used in the DMCA exemption and that is in the DOJ policy is actually pretty good. It was certainly the result of a lot of wrangling. Overall, I think that it is more expeditious if a few bad apples 
slip through the cracks than if we write something that is so hard to qualify as a good faith security researcher that people aren't going to do it because then it's as though you don't have that carve out at all. If it's too hard to meet it, then people will be dissuaded from trying to. It's the same as not having those protections. Um, in actual practice, when we've seen people try to claim that they're good faith researchers when in fact they are malicious actors, courts and juries have seen through that. So if you remember, um, Paige Thompson, who was a former Amazon engineer, uh, committed a massive hack of hundreds of tens of millions of people's Capital One information with the Capital One breach. She got prosecuted and convicted. She tried to say, oh, I'm a good faith researcher. The government was like, then why did you install crypto miners on these hacked servers? And uh, she went to prison for that. So the jury saw through that. Similarly, um, if you're familiar with the NSO group, they have been arguing in the court filings where WhatsApp and Apple have been suing them for uh, using vulnerability in WhatsApp and in iMessage to hack the phones of journalists and dentists and so whatever. And I saw this, tried to say, hey, look, Apple found out about this vulnerability because we're the same as researchers. And the judge was like, no, no. Like, you still cause all this harm to them. And that's why, when like, some people who think that there just shouldn't be a civil cause of action in the CFA at all, I do think that there should be to continue to let companies like Facebook or Apple hold folks like an NSO group accountable. Um, and so I, I sort of have faith that like we need more clarity about those sort of gray areas about what is or isn't good faith research and especially where it's the government who gets to make that decision about whether somebody qualifies for the policy or not. But that isn't to say that I think the language that is being used in the DMCA that has been borrowed for the CFA context is bad overall. I think it comes down to a lot of like case by case applications um, and in terms of how to make that better. You know, I, I, I would just hope that policymakers could focus on the overall goal of having something that is a protection on the books rather than being afraid, oh, we've drawn the line in the wrong place. And sometimes people who are not fully like white hats are going to slip through. I don't know if that answers the question. Uh, we got like a minute for like one more question, maybe. All right. I'll be around if you have other questions. Thank you so much. Thank Great, thanks so much. Rihanna, I just want to thank you personally uh, for coming out and for participating. We are going to get set up for the next panel. We have our Arizona State Election Security panel coming up next. We have to do a little reconfiguration, uh, but please stick around. It's going to be great. Thank you.